that I go to, we put in adjustments to the agenda. I just want to go to See it. Welcome to the Monday, March 9th, Town of Scarborough Planning Board meeting. I'd like to call this meeting to order. If you could all join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, Doreen, could you call the roll, please? Nicholas McGee? Here. Rachel Henriksen? Here. Robin Saunders? Here. Richard Duperry? Here. Jennifer Ladd? Here. Rick Meinking? Here. Thank you. We have um, Roger Bealey is absent this evening, so Rick Duperry will be a voting member tonight. Uh, point of order on this agenda, I'm going to make a motion to move number 12, Valentine Development, LLC, request a subdivision amendment for Eastern Village Assessor's Map RO73, Lot 21A and B. I'm going to move that to item number 9. Everything else will just fall down. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Show that it's unanimous. Thank you. <laughs> Next item is the Planning Board will conduct a public hearing to receive comment on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the Zoning Ordinance. Jamal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'll actually provide an overview of the both public hearings. These are related. Um, so last year, the Maine Legislature amended state law pertaining to the recording of plans of the County Registries of Deeds. Um, so they no longer accept plans printed on mylars. Um, so the town is um, updating their ordinances or our ordinances to be consistent with state law. Um, so it's for this one, it'd be the private way residential development standards. Um, for the next one, it'd be the subdivision ordinance. Um, so looking forward, the town will be consistent with the state and uh, just accept final plans on paper instead of mylar. That's the proposed amendments. Turn it back to you. Thank you, Jamel. Uh, we have an opportunity for public comment on this item. Is there anyone here that would wish to speak on this? Please approach the podium and state your name. Seeing none, I'm gonna close public comments. Are there any comments from the board on this? No, seeing none, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to say that the board is supportive of this. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm going to take a quick step back and do the minutes. I did skip one. Uh, we have the minutes from the February 18th, 2020 meeting. Uh, if everyone has had a copy of those and reviewed them, I will entertain a motion to approve those. I'll make sure. Thank you, Rick. Do we have a second? Second. second. Any discussion on those? All in favor? So that to be unanimous, thank you. Next item on the board agenda is the Planning Board will conduct a public hearing to receive comment on the proposed amendments to Chapter 406, Subdivision Ordinance. Jamal. Uh, the same overview I gave um, pertains to this as well. So leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, we have an opportunity for public comment on this. Is there anyone that would like to speak? Seeing none, I'm gonna close public comment. I'm going to assume the board does not have a problem with any of the changes. Give our good positive thoughts on this to the council, please. Thanks. Next item is Scarborough Public Schools request an advisory opinion for 143 Highland Avenue, Assessor's Map RO79, Lot 1. Jamel. All right. So for this item, um, it's the Pleasant Hill School, um, the R2 Zoning District at 143 Highland Ave. Uh, so given that the school department, uh, the town actually is, is the applicant, uh, the board is required to provide an advisory opinion uh, on the proposal. So the proposal includes uh, the construction of a new modular classroom and a new five foot wide paved sidewalk that will connect to the existing sidewalk on the property. Uh, staff has provided several minor uh, review comments for the board's consideration. Uh, at this point, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jamel. Would you like to introduce yourself on the project, please? Sure. Good evening, Mr. Chair. My name is Doug Reynolds with Goral Palmer. Uh, here representing Scarborough Public, Public Schools for the uh, Pleasant Hill Primary School Portable Edition. Um, as Jamel mentioned, we're uh, proposing a 68 by 28 portable building, approximately 1,900 square feet. 
Uh, there will be two classrooms in um, that building. They will be connected um, to the south of the existing uh, portable classroom that was constructed back in 2007-ish, 2002-ish is what I'm being told. Um, so, and, and currently there are 39 parking spaces on the lot. The expansion of the addition of these two classrooms uh, maintain um, the, the, the parking requirements. Um, utilities will all be brought into um, the existing portable classroom and under the existing portable classroom with the exception of propane will be connected to the uh, propane tank adjacent to the parking lot. Um, based on some a meeting with staff, staff was concerned with what we were doing with the roof runoff from the portable classroom and what we've decided to do is um, from the downspouts into an un subsurface um, under drain pipe foundation drain connecting to the existing catch basins within the parking lot. Um, the structure itself will be very similar to the one that was just constructed at Eight Corner School, stick built Schiavi home, vinyl siding, um, slightly pitched roof. Um, one of the comments that we did receive was relative to potentially adding some trees at the top of the slope behind the building. Um, we've had discussions since with the uh, with staff and indicated that uh, one, um, that it's mostly wooded behind the building and we'll be removing trees. And two, we don't know if uh, we'll be adding another portable anytime soon and we wouldn't want to plant new trees and have to take them out. Um, so again, as Jamel mentioned, we're here for an advisory opinion review, get comments from the board. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, we have an opportunity for public comment on this item. If there's anyone here that would like to speak, please approach the podium and state your name. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment on this item. Uh, just going to open this up to uh, general questions from anyone on the board. Rick, uh, Mike. King. Is this going to be a new portable or is it a used one? Brand new portable. You do know they're putting fluorescent lights in it and it's got a propane. According to the plans, it says fluorescent lights. They're, uh, Todd's telling me that they actually are LEDs, not fluorescent. Well, that's not what the plans say. Okay. And it, just assuming that the nameplate data is right, the load on this thing is about 51 kW which if you're liberal and give 186 days of school time, that's roughly 77,000 kilowatt hours and that'll cost you about 10 grand. So I would be concerned that we don't putting in LED lights. And uh, is this gonna be air conditioned? Yes, it will be. Because it just indicates the heat is a propane heater but I'm assuming then that part of that 51 or that 37 K on that unit is the compressor for the air conditioning. All right. So you're looking at roughly a 10 grand electric bill out of that unit. So I'm just, my advisory is to make sure that when it's delivered, it has the new led lights in it. That is, that is the intention. Thanks Rick. Any other members of the board that like to offer some insight? Um, I have a question. Was there any talk about any sort of under drain at the foot of the slope where you'll be regrading out from um, this new building? I only ask as a parent of a kindergartner um, at this school who does laundry pretty much on the daily these days because of the amount of mud out there right now. Um, it, and it's just really wet and it doesn't seem to drain very well. <clears throat> so um, I see that you're adding the under drain from the building. I didn't know if there was an opportunity to maybe take a look at tying in the foot of that slope to there. Um, we haven't considered it at this time. Um, picking up any water at, uh, from that slope, I mean, we're gonna be picking it up at the top with, with the, um, the roof drain and, the, and the, um, uh, the drip edge that's going around the building so it should reduce some of the flows down to that area. Um, putting an underdrain at the bottom of that, um, again, we wouldn't have any outlet other than on a neighboring property. Um, so again, it wouldn't, um, you wouldn't be able to do that. 
And then um, just to follow up on the com, I know there was a comment about adding plantings at the top of that slope, which you addressed, but um, as sort of just a non-standard comment, this 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 part of the hill that's out there today is just like a really um, popular part of the play area for the kids in this area, particularly in the winter for sledding. And um, it's very much n not, it doesn't feel to me like the same type of slope that we would want to protect on a lot of other types of developments. It feels much more integrated into the site. So um, I'm actually kind of glad to hear that you won't be planting anything at the top of that because I think it would sort of um, prohibit that in a way. That, that so. was one of the concerns yeah. as well. <laughs> they, it wouldn't last that, very that's long. Their that's their sledding hill. Yeah. That's all. Thank you, Jen. Any other planning board comments? No? All right, seeing none. Good luck to you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Next item on tonight's agenda is Ballantyne Development LLC requests a site plan review for lots 128A and 128B, North Village Assessor's Map RO73, lot 21A. Now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so as you recall, this is uh, located in the TNZ, TND Zoning District, uh, located just to the north of the existing uh, Eastern Village subdivision. So the applicant was last before the board in late January. Um, as a reminder, the applicant's proposing um, to construct five three-story multifamily residential buildings um, consisting of 84 apartments served by a public street. The proposal also includes garages, a community building, a dog park, um, some pedestrian trails, and a new public street with sidewalks on both sides. Uh, as requested, the applicant is proposing to construct a sidewalk uh, along Ward Street now that will connect the project to the sidewalk system along Route 1. Staff has offered several review comments related to the details of the sidewalk, um, so the applicant just should be sure to discuss these, this design with the board. The applicant has also updated the plans to include areas where the existing vegetation will remain and has coordinated the proposed landscaping with the existing trees as well. The applicant included some photographs uh, that appear to include views of the site and the screening that the existing vegetation will provide. So the applicant should be sure to discuss uh, these visual materials uh, with the board, and the board should provide direction um, to the applicant this evening on your comfort with the proposed screening provisions for the project. Um, and based on prior discussions, um, the board had requested a phasing plan, um, an updated phasing plan that includes the North Village as well as a status update of open phases of development within Eastern Village, uh, and staff was unable to find this uh, within the submission to the board. And there remains questions about the overall design of the, over, of the proposed nature trail uh, between Ward Street and Classical Lane, including the proposed grading and other associated details. Um, so staff did receive um, a good amount of public comment um, for the project, and this, these uh, that were distributed to the board uh, accordingly. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Jamel. Gary, would you like to introduce the project? Please um, try to go over any changes from the last meeting, and then, of course, if you could touch on all of the main elements specifically um, that con that staff has brought up in the comments. Thanks. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Kerry Anderson, Ballantyne Development. With me tonight is Steve Bushy from Laurel Palmer, and Sean McGilvery from the Mike Keller Moore Architects. And uh, we were here at the January meeting. We left uh, with the understanding to address. Um, uh, some items here with, um, with, the, with the new plans we've submitted. Uh, the first thing I think we'd like to uh, make note of is when we were here for the previous meetings, we have wanted to construct the project coming, uh, leaving the structure on up in the Ward Street end so we could work out of it's our shop. We have a lot of equipment and uh, tools in there and whatnot. Uh, here in comments from the last meeting, we've abandoned that, changed that around. The project will now be constructed coming in from the Ward Street end, and we will put a fire gate down at the end of Camden Street uh, so that no vehicles will access uh, Ballantyne Drive. That fire gate will remain up as long as town requests it. 
we will leave it up through the occupancy of the first building or all of the buildings before we remove it. We leave it up to uh, uh, staff as far as when they want us to open that up. But there will be no traffic that will go out onto Ballantyne Drive. It will all come in through Ward Street. So that's the first thing that's um, uh, with respect to the uh, phasing of the project. It will still remain one phase. So we would get under, we would uh, start construction and, and complete it through, uh, but we'll all come in through Ward Street. The second um, thing was when we were here at the last meeting, the um, discussion about a sidewalk. We have met with uh, the town staff and public works, and uh, we've come to an agreement on what that sidewalk will look at, look, look like. Uh, it will be on the north side going from the North Village to Route 1. Uh, it'll be five and a half feet wide and it'll be constructed at, uh, at my expense. Along with that, we'll be uh, restriping the crosswalk up at the top of Ward Street and putting in a uh, ped pad for signal signaling the crosswalk for motioning uh, if, that if that's determined to be needed. The other thing that was discussed at the last meeting was lighting. We submitted a photometric plan and uh, uh, we've looked at the uh, looked at the lighting, tried to see what we can do to uh, uh, put timers on or dimmers on and whatnot. And the lighting that goes down um, Camden Street is going to be a town uh, light. It'll have a eye on the top of the light, so it will go on and off with the uh, the degrees of darkness. That's something that we didn't take a look at, figuring that the town probably wants to leave that on, but we'll leave it up to the town as far as how they want to uh, um, cut that light off or, or whatnot. The same fixture, the A fixture that's in the parking lots, what we will do on that is we will have those set up on a timer so that they will come on when it gets dark enough to require them and then have those go off at uh, 11 o'clock, the A fixtures inside the parking lot um, to uh, address that. Now, that doesn't uh, take into account weather conditions like fog, snow, things along those lines, which would require more light versus less light, but we're willing to do that if, um, if the board uh, requests that. Uh, that would be the A lights in the parking lots. The B lights are bollards. They, uh, they're low to the ground. They put up very little light. We would, and they also light up the sidewalk areas in the parking lots. We would be leaving those on. So those would come on at night and they would go off in the morning. Those would be on a timer. Um, the C lights, which are the lights under the building porticos, those need to stay on all night because they're right at building entry. Those are actually up inside, the, up in the ceiling, shining down in the porticos. There's really very little light that splashes out from them, but we need to leave those on again for building access. And then the D fixtures are lights that are mounted on the tops of garage, above garage doors and whatnot. Almost all of those lights shine away from the abutting properties, and we would uh, like to leave those on uh, especially given that once we eliminate the A, the pole mounted lights in the parking areas, we'll be relying on the D lights, the fixtures that are above the garage doors, which shine down to kind of illuminate uh, those parking areas that aren't going to have the light from the pole lights that we've cut off. So we're willing to do that if that, uh, if that uh, is what the board wants uh, as far as the lighting goes. In addition to that, we supplied a photometric plan and uh, one of the comments that came back from staff on the photometric plan was that uh, asked for us to submit a follow-up plan, I believe, because it wasn't clear. Uh, I talked to the lighting uh, engineer on Friday about that, and he said if I can tell him specifically what staff's looking for us to do, that we can do that. Uh, but he said that what was submitted was per the ordinance, so we're happy to do whatever it is that you're looking for on that. We just need to know what it is on that, uh, on that photometric plan. 
The next item. The next item is uh, traffic. And uh, Steve Bushy is here who can answer any of the traffic related questions. We did get a letter from DOT uh, saying that there was no traffic movement permit amended uh, needed given the uh, small amount of additional trips. Steve can talk to that uh, more so. And um, uh, stormwater being another item too that the board asked us to make sure that we got uh, stormwater designed to the town for review and whatnot. So uh, I'd be happy to have Steve uh, talk about uh, those two items there with respect to that. And the last item that we had as far as, as, far as like bigger points to talk about when we left the last meeting was the, um, was the buffer. We took a look at, um, first thing that we went and did was we went out on the site and realized that we uh, didn't put on the plan the amount of existing, existing vegetation. So we have got that located on the plan. And in addition to that, we had the building locations staked out. And what we did was we took pictures, which you, you can see here on the plan, that shows looking back from those uh, particular building locations back at the structures along those, along, back at, looking at those structures so you can see the uh, amount of existing vegetation and what, those, uh, what, they, what, they, what they show. The, the uh, large part of those, that existing vegetation that you see in those pictures will remain. Uh, as I say, we took the pictures from where the building was staked out, and uh, there's a small amount of the uh, trees that will have to uh, go behind building number uh, 21, uh, but not much, and then most of the other vegetation will remain. And I've got Sean McGilver here that can talk to you about that. With that, I can go down through the staff comments that were in the uh, peer review, but uh, I don't know if you want to address those items before I get into those. Okay. So the other items that were in the peer review that we also talked about was there was discussion also about building colors. Uh, we wanted to stick with white buildings with red roofs. Um, after the last meeting, uh, Sean McGilvray took a look at what colors could be used, earth tones, that would blend into that area the best and, uh, uh, and stick out the least. And he, we, we've changed the building colors. I can have him talk about that uh, when he comes up. But uh, the buildings uh, are looking, uh, will be changed. The color will be changed on those now. They will not be uh, all white buildings with red roofs. We um, met with uh, Public Works uh, today about what it is that they're looking for on the plans for the sidewalk work on Ward Street and understand exactly what they're looking for. Um, we got, we've, uh, we will put those on the plan and address, give those to the, get those to the town. The comment about homeowner docs, MOU, I talked to the attorney on Friday and uh, there will be no homeowner docs. Uh, we're not looking to make it an association. Uh, we would just have the responsibilities that run down Camden Street and on the properties around North Village, which will be a requirement of me that they will just run with the land. So if I sell it in the future, those responsibilities would, fa would fall onto the, the purchaser of the property. Um, but nevertheless, um, if we need to get together with town and come up with some language on the, uh, on the as far as addressing those, a memorandum of understanding or whatever else we need to do, we're we're happy to do that, and um, um, we'll get together with the town as soon as we can to get those things uh, addressed. The Uh, one of the other comments was on the uh, couple of waivers. Um, I realized, Jamel, you weren't here at the last meeting, but the board voted uh, in favor of um, 
the two waivers that we uh, asked for at the last meeting. So hoping that is no longer an issue at this point. The uh, site utilization layout, the building separations have been noted on the plan and uh, I'm sh updated plan should have been sent to Jamel today uh, showing those. Uh, the, also the building numbers on uh, sheet 3.1 have been updated to reflect the correct building numbers which are actually the addresses instead of one through uh, six like they were previously shown. Um, we've got a construction um, uh, route that we have on a plan and should have been sent to town staff today and also through Eastern Village showing the, uh, the only location where construction traffic can, can go in and out and that traffic uh, previously has gone out through Eastern Road and up through Ward Street that will need to uh, cease going up Ward Street because that will be a a uh, walking trail, but um, we'd like to use that road for um, most of the, most of the uh, uh, construction of North Village and uh, nearing the end of, of North Village, obviously reclaim that area and get that area vegetated. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd ask uh, Steve Bushy to come up and address the traffic and stormwater and Sean McGilvery to address the architecture. Thank you. Yep. Evening of the board, Steve Bushy with Goral Palmer. I'll be brief. On the traffic side of things, Carrie had mentioned, we did get a letter from the DOT in regards to not requiring a uh, traffic movement permit for uh, a category of two pieces of the project that remain. So there's some development on Eastern Village, some undeveloped lots, plus the traffic attributable to the North Village. Combining those two pieces uh, yields a trip generation amount that is less than 100 trips uh, in the peak hour. The DOT reviewed that uh, and they said you don't need to have a uh, traffic movement permit on that basis. So that's kind of step one of the traffic side of things. Uh, I know Bill Bray has asked for uh, a couple of additional pieces of information. I believe we've provided him some uh, trip counts that we had performed, our office had performed uh, earlier in the year. And so you have that as the basis of uh, what the existing developments currently generating traffic. Mr. Braze also asks uh, a question in regards to the Eastern Road, Black Point Road intersection. And I'll note, going back a little bit in time, I think there were a few board members here when the South Village project was uh, reviewed and approved. At that time, I was with a, an, another firm and we had retained a, uh, a transportation engineer, traffic engineer, who had done an analysis of uh, accident history. This was back in the 2014 through 2016 time period. And I don't believe that the crossing signals, the push button uh, activated flasher uh, beacons had been installed all that long, but there was a concern at that time about uh, accidents happening because of that push button. Uh, we provided a report during that South Village review and uh, had a number of recommendations, key of which were reduction in the speed limit. And I note today, I think at the time we did that, um, that was like 2018, speed limit was 45 on Black Point Road. And it's now signed as 35 on both sides of that. So I think that was uh, one of the recommendations that had come out. I don't know how the police department was probably involved with that speed reduction piece. And then there were some other uh, recommendations in regard to placement of the signage, where it needed to be uh, placed and so forth. I can say now uh, some updated history on the traffic uh, and accident pieces. That location still remains to be a high accident location according to the DOT's records. This is what I'm uh, gathering from uh, my office who have uh, evaluated a lot of intersections here in the community uh, for a number of different projects. Uh, that location still has uh, predominance of uh, rear end collisions that are happening. Uh, presumably, as I've evaluated the data, I'm not a traffic engineer, I'm trying to be brief and, and just give you some concise background on it, but uh, basically it's uh, approaching vehicles, somebody pushes the button to cross uh, the eastern trail, bicyclist, pedestrian, runner, what have you, first vehicles stop and uh, they're getting rear ended from somebody who's not quite paying attention and uh, that's been the predominance. I think the numbers speak to 16 or 17 accidents over the course of a uh, three-year period, 2016 through 2018. And so that information will provide on to Mr. Bray. 
Uh, I believe there's been a discussion or perhaps the town has been approached by uh, various residents and so forth about the installation of traffic signal there. Uh, I'll speak very uh, briefly on that piece. It's not likely to warrant a traffic signal. The town engineer has uh, asked us to take a quick look at it and we will do that and, and say uh, the challenge there with a the traffic signal is that the side uh, traffic volumes from Eastern Road just probably aren't going to be even close to warranting a traffic signal there. So um, traffic, the town engineer has asked about that. We can respond to that certainly uh, as part of a back and forth here with uh, the, the town. Um, that's what I know on, on the traffic side. Stormwater management, I'll speak to the DEP. We did get our DEP permit. We provided you folks a full um, report that had gone through DEP uh, permit. Uh, review and approval. I believe we fundamentally have satisfied all of the various issues there as far as stormwater management. Uh, I think the site relatively unique in that uh, we're relying on a number of uh, uh, BMPs. We have some porous pavement which is unique to the development. First time of being able to implement that. We've got some drip edges for the roof uh, drains and as well we have a couple of sizable stormwater management facilities, the new wet pond off of Eastern Road, as well as the Valentine Pond. Um, so those are key pieces as far as the technical side. Kerry's gone through a couple of the other items. Uh, I guess I'd emphasize uh, the importance of uh, the Ward Street sidewalk piece and discussions with Public Works Director about that and the installation of a push -push button signal for pedestrian crossings right at the Route 1. I'll note as well, back on the traffic, um, that since the original development here and the implementation from the town as to impact fees, the current, despite not needing a traffic movement permit, the uh, traffic impact fee will be about $133,000. So it's a pretty sizable amount relative to uh, revenue that will be generated by a very small amount of traffic. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to the architect. Thank you, Steve. Sean McGilvery, E. My Kellermore Architects. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about <clears> the <throat> graphic up on the screen, which is, as Kerry said, several photos shot out on site. Uh, Kerry had the surveyor mark out the back of the buildings where we have building seven, Dive Ballantyne, and 21 and 29, which are the larger 24 unit buildings. And the existing vegetation that's out there for the most part is going to remain. That's why we shot these photos. Um, there is a build, you know, view A, as you can see, heavily wooded at that area, and that's all to remain. Um, the parking lot area right now is the clearing in front of you. B doesn't have a lot of undergrowth, which we're recognizing. So in that area, we are planting at the property line two rows, and uh, one of them being evergreen, the other one being deciduous. And C is pretty uh, it's a good undergrowth and um, that is to remain as well for the most part it's where the wetlands are so we've stopped the parking we have a few garages at the end but for the most part that is open as well as as well as D there's a slight break in that and like I said we'll be planting at the back of the property line abutting the neighbors uh, E is a similar story we're set further back uh, across the dog park so there might be some low clearing in there, but for the most part, there is a existing existing vegetation that was going to remain in place. Once we saw all this and um, you know put it on the plan, we wanted to address a few. If we can go to the next slide, I believe it's the one after this. Uh, can you go back one? Actually, it must be the other way. So that graphic. Oh, sorry, right there. Uh, so this graphic here, what we did is the comments we received last time. The you know some of the bigger concerns were the resident that was the closest, which is lot 136. So at that lot, what we did is we did a silhouette incorporating that exact build and the topography and seven Camden. And what we did is we took what was parking because there was concerns about headlights and, um, and, and the sort and, and just looking out at a parking area from the second floor window. So we switched the parking with the garage and moved it as far as we could away from the 136 lot and in addition to that we took the um, the concerns about reg regarding uh, the buffer and this area which is fairly clear 
we put in, we're requesting, um, or we're proposing a berm with plantings on top, two rows deep, and there's an existing fence in place, but you get an idea of what that would look like when it's built out. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's mostly gonna cover the back of that garage, which is a plain wall garage, no lighting on the back of the garage itself, but it adds as a one-story element to cut, cut down you know, the view of um, 7 Camden, which seemed to be of a concern to the resident. The, that, was, uh, that was what was addressed on this one. You can also see in a smaller scale here, 7 Camden on the bottom left-hand side, we have added a layover gable on the, uh, the uh, side that's facing lot 136 to um, give it a, a little more curb appeal. Uh, that that's it on that one for what we've added and what we've what we've adjusted to this plan with that I would um, I would add that the the next thing we looked at was uh, you know the aesthetics of of uh, the, the the white larger buildings and how we can address that as Carrie said and change the color so if you can scoot down two pages on this so here we have the tw a 12 unit. This one's happened to be seven Camden with the layover gable on the south side. And what we are proposing right now, right now is for comparison, of course, we have white hardy and white trim, ASIC trim. We were proposing a light taupe trim on this. And this is the physical sample of it next to it. And on, this is all 12 unit buildings would be, would be this here and we'd vary the the, the height of it from the lower story to the upper story. It'd be, it'd be taller than this is what I'm getting at. The 24 unit buildings would be a little darker. And uh, if we can scoot a couple more pages down, we can see that if you keep going to 21, 29, which is the next uh, two more slides, I think. There we go. So these are images of, of that color on, on the top right hand corner there with, with that trim and the siding sample that I have here today. So we took this being the darker one and earth tones and ran it throughout. Those were the changes since last time incorporated into these documents to, to address those concerns. Beyond that, the photometric plan that Kerry had mentioned, um, we submitted the fixture types and we also have the photometric plan, which I believe was, I don't know if it's a separate slide than this, but I can show you. So as to address the, the clarity on this plan, we have outlined what was the um, town set node of 0.1 foot candle. So on this here, we have the building seven parking and the lamppost that would be on, as Carrie said, but shut off at a certain time for night. The bollards would remain on, the garage lights would remain on and all that light would stay in the parking area. Nothing goes over the property lines, the same story over here. The street parking type A fixtures would remain on. The parking type A fixtures would turn off at a set time and we would have the garage lights illuminating the parking area, once again, keeping it, keeping it low. The difference, of course, is that the lamp posts go up to the 12 foot mark and everything else would be anywhere from eight to 10 above grade. And uh, these don't, you know, 21 and 29 are pretty far away, but it's the same, same story. In most cases, we've positioned the garages to be facing away from adjacent properties for, for light spill. And I think, like, as we said, the biggest concern is this area when it's filled in, when we have the berm in place, the heavy, the heavy planting that we're focusing on in here and, and in this area would be, would be offset by you know, whatever we're proposing, proposing here. I, I believe that sums up all of the, uh, is that anything else you think of? I think that's, that sums up all the changes to the plans that we've uh, submitted today. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, we do have an opportunity for public comment at this time. Um, I'm going to limit public comment to four minutes. I do a little courtesy tap when you have 30 seconds left to go. We ask you to try to maintain within the four minutes uh, just because there are quite a few of you here. So with that, I would like to open it up. If you approach the podium, state your name for the record and please provide us. Hi, uh, my name is Jim Marshall. I live at 7 Inspiration Drive. Uh, going to the architect's last comment, I'd be very interested to see on where that berm is. Is it just for 26 Ballantyne or does it also protect the other neighbors? And that's why I think we need definitely need to have a landscaping plan that really shows where everything is going to be going. Um, as I said before, uh, right now it is uh, built to the maximum ordinance North Village is allows it's the number of, a maximum number of apartments he can get in that space and as the developer stated earlier his stated goal is to maximize the profit which I totally understand as well however uh, the buildings at three stories are uh, out of character with the one single family homes and the duplexes as well as the townhomes and there's been another duplex constructed that you cannot see it's uh, another homeowner who will be impacted also. Uh, on the way I view it, there are kind of two solutions. If you look at, uh, could you just click on the bottom one screenshot? Right there, perfect. That is going to show an image of the sight line. So this does not show the parking lots or the garage buildings. If you look at 7 Camden Street, it is within 150 feet of the property line at 26 Valentine, and uh, as well as its neighbor, I believe at 30 Valentine is also. Uh, that does not include the garage buildings. It does not include the parking lot either. Um, and that, to me, is this very high density. So the solutions are to maybe move Building 7 to the or Building uh, 14 to, to Lot 25. I believe it's at the end of Ward Street. And that property has been used for uh, to mitigate the density of Northern Village. And I know that other people are going to speak to that. Or you just have to install much more robust buffering could you click on the next image, Jamel, please? It's uh, the next one up from the bottom. We'll work from the bottom to the top. This is of Cornerstone Estates, which is at the corner of Commerce Drive and uh, Route 1. Uh, these are houses at the bottom of the picture. And that's an uh, office park at the top. The interesting thing about this image is that Northern Village would basically be where most of the buffering is in this shot. As you can see, that gives you an idea was within 150 feet of 26 Ballantyne to Building 7, and it's 147 feet between the, the image on the far left and one of the office buildings. Uh, the Building 7 would, would be within that buffer there. So uh, that gives you an idea of the close proximity and why they need a robust buffer. And there would also be a parking lot in there too, and that speaks to possibly moving the building to another part of the development. That is a very good buffer. As you can see, the vegetation, and on the right side is a berm. Um, and I, that is a kind of buffer that we'd be seeking where that would create a, a good screen for headlights and also for privacy. Jamel, could you please go to the next one? Uh, the next image up, uh, just work up from the bottom there. Thank you. Okay, this is a shot of the berm. And uh, we're talking about, a, that's, a, that's a story and a half there. Uh, we'd be looking at the, uh, it would almost go up to the top of that tree. That's the size building we're talking about if you included the, the roof line kind of towering over the neighboring buildings. But at least that buffer there would be, pre create a very good screen for many headlights or people looking in from the parking lot. Could you please go to the next one? Thank you very much. Uh, again, another view of the buffer. You can go to the next one. Thank you, Jamel. Uh, and this is a look at the vegetation screen from the parking lot of that office park, uh, looking back at the Cornerstone Estates. 
and the privacy of those residents is totally screened off, not only by the burn, but also by a much wider set of education, vegetation. And in the landscaping plan that we currently have, I do not feel that there is nearly enough buffer. Also, the, uh, many of those shots that were taken by the developer, uh, there are a lot, there's not underbrush, there are fallen trees, trees that have fallen down. So, uh, and I'm, again, we're not really sure of the suitability of that uh, for you know, being able to sustain more growth. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. You guys do a great job and we really appreciate all of your help. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Natalie Burns. I'm an attorney at Johnson <coughs> Baird Gardner and Henry and I'm here tonight representing Nancy Pack and Jim Marshall. Um, I, I'll try to be very brief about this. First of all, Jim's already talked about buffering. I don't want to repeat what he said about the edges of the property, but I do want to point out again that the ordinance requires landscaping within the parking lot, not just at the property boundaries. And it also requires that the parking lot itself be buffered. It's very much appreciated that there's a much more robust planting plan along the property lines, but the ordinance says clearly that it's supposed to be the parking lots that are buffered. Um, so we would ask that the board require that um, as, the, as the ordinance requires. In addition, there's supposed to be 10% of the parking lot landscaped. Um, looking at this plan, I don't see any landscaping in the vast majority of the parking lots. Again, that's a requirement and this board should hold the applicant to these requirements. Um, I would uh, finally note, I know this, that we raised this at the last meeting, uh, that some of the plantings, particularly of red maple, still appear to be in wetland areas and the board should ask for confirmation uh, that those plantings are going to be able to be successful uh, where they're proposed to be planted. Uh, we do appreciate that there's a lot of addition of uh, pines in this one. Um, evergreen is certainly a much more effective buffer. Uh, the maples might look nice, but they're not much of a buffer. Um, Jim's already talked about the berm, which was something I was going to talk about, so I'm not going to repeat that, except that um, certainly all of the property owners along this bottom edge would like to have a berm because that does make that buffer that much more effective if the trees are planted on top of a berm. Um, one of the issues that I noted was, and the applicant addressed this, that the maintenance agreement, um, because it is only going to be one owner of the property, the declaration might not be the most effective way to do that. However, the proposed maintenance agreement um, is a one-party agreement. The town is not an agreement, is not a party to the agreement as it's drafted. The town has the right to enforce it, but the only way the town can enforce the agreement, frankly, underneath uh, under the terms of the agreement is to go on the property and fix the problem. And I don't think that's what the town wants. I think that's something that you, you should be addressing with your own legal counsel, but I just wanted to bring that up so that um, that didn't accidentally uh, get overlooked. Um, another issue that I wanted to uh, discuss very quickly is the connection to Ward Street. I have not seen documents providing for the trail easement, I would urge the board to make sure that that easement be finalized in this phase. Uh, even if there's gonna be construction traffic there, the easement can be written in such a way that it doesn't take effect until the construction is done. But because of something that's later on in your agenda, if you don't provide for this now, there's a good chance that you're gonna be getting asked for an amendment to the plan later on because someone else doesn't want the trail there. So we would ask that you really, um, require that now and related to that is the phasing plan which I know that the staff has asked for that. We think it's really important you look at what's required in each phase because this phase is being done ahead of where it was initially proposed to be which is as the applicant has said and it's true he can move up the phases but if he moves the phases around you need to make sure that you're getting the public improvements that you expect to have when you expect to have them. And with that, I am done. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Robert Mood. I am the uh, aforementioned person at 26 Ballantyne. Um, 
I had a lot of really good notes for you tonight, but now I think that I need to kind of change up what I'm going to say. Um, the one thing I wanted to say quickly was, you know, that I think it's great that the developer has taken some steps uh, to try to do something uh, about the challenges that we have being the closest of butters. Um, but it's not enough, clearly. A 45-foot building behemoth staring into my backyard at less than 150 feet, it's just not acceptable. Now, um, Jamal, if you'll go to the civil plan, page four. One of the things that I would like to talk about is that I think there is an opportunity. So it's the next one up. Yeah, right there. <clears throat> um, this is new information for me tonight. I didn't have it when I spoke to you last month. Um, there's this new lot 25, Jim mentioned it a moment ago. Right here. This lot. This lot was not on any of the diagrams, any of the submission documents that were provided last month. This is very new information, but I think what it does is it presents an opportunity for us to have a conversation about how we can balance achieving the goals for growth with limiting the impact on my neighborhood and me. So if you look and think about the size of that, there's a couple of things that are really good that jumps out. One is contiguous to the property of the development in question. It has no wetlands, it's largely open space, and it also happens to be right adjunct to the very opening of the beginning of this development. So I think there's a very easy opportunity for us to take building seven and building 14 and the associated outbuildings, parking spaces, and garage, and find a way to locate those on lot 25. This would do two things. I mean, it will do a lot of things, but I think two that I want to highlight. One is that a lot of this buffering that we've been talking about, it generates the space. It generates the opportunity for us to have that buffer and talk about what are going to be the things we want in that buffer to make it better. Yes, I want to burn. Yes, I want those trees, right? But I think this creates that opportunity. I think the second thing that I want to highlight is that it would go a long way to as somebody put it last week or last month, creating some goodwill on behalf of the developer to us, the community, his neighbor. You know, again, I think that these are the opportunities. This is the thing I would like for this board to think carefully about. Again, I really appreciate your time. You know, I chose to invest by buying my home in this community. I'm part of this town. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm Barbara Thielen. I reside at One Valentine Place. Um, we're, um, I'm part of the Valentine Place development, which is that separate 15 unit condominium. Um, I'm here both personally for my husband and myself, and also I'm speaking as a board member um, for the condominium development. I want to first thank Kerry um, for one of the changes that he's made, which is the construction entrance um, now coming off of Ward Street rather than Valentine. Um, this was a real safety concern for people, especially on Valentine and it goes a long way to address those concerns. Um, I sent a letter to the board today um, that really cited four specific points. Um, I think others are gonna to speak to those points. Uh, the one that I really wanna mention is one that is of particular concern to Ballantyne Place condominium development, and that is the storm water that's gonna be coming into Ballantyne Pond. Um, we've taken a look at the stormwater treatment method of the site development plan, which is, I believe, is sheet C 5.1. And it shows from, you know, from just my eyes, if you look at the, the purple area, that is the area that is going to be diverted into Ballantyne Pond. Um, to this point, um, all of the upkeep, both financial and physical, has been done um, in the pond by the Condominium Association and some of the abutting owners of Eastern Village. 
We've also read the document that's entitled Stormwater Management System Operation and Maintenance Manual, and the um, Condominium Association supports the implementation of the tasks outlined in the manual to ensure the ongoing health of the pond. Um, but our concerns regarding that manual are twofold. The most important is um, how is it going to be implemented? How are any changes or improvements going to be financed? And most importantly, who's going to enforce the items that are addressed in the manual? All of these are needed to continue the health of the pond so that it can accept um, the storm water as shown on this plan. Um, in addition, um, currently there's some anecdotal evidence that the pond may be experiencing some unhealthy issues. Uh, apparently last summer a lot of the wildlife have disappeared from the pond, the turtles, the birds, um, the, a lot of the growth um, on the sides, the cattails in the middle have all disappeared. You can see the rising of the silt in the pond. So the Condominium Association would really like to see before any of this storm water begins to dump into the pond, um, a study to be done of Ballantine Pond that would actually show the health, um, begin to tell us any remedial actions that need to be taken, um, you know, what those costs would be, what it might involve, if anything. And um, it would also ensure that if there, once this additional storm water, which will change in nature because it's not just normal flow over a vegetated wooded area, it's flow that's going to be generated by a large apartment complex. Um, it will know that when it comes into the pond, the pond's going to be able to handle it. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, Paula Sorrentino. I live on Federal Way, and I'm a former EVA board member. My comments may um, not be pleasing to all, but if you all can read the room, you'll get a good sense that the community of Eastern Village is coming together not to preclude Cary from building North Village, but to ensure that we're working together as a community. One of the things I want to just mention is South Village when it was built, um, we can go back in history, but it's not really worth it, but it's part of the Eastern Village subdivision plan. Therefore, should be respectful of the Eastern Village Assembly declarations, which means there should be financial contributions to the ongoing maintenance of and common elements that are both in South Village and Eastern Village, particularly the pond. I won't repeat what Barbara said, but we have some very significant concerns about both ponds and what will be the ongoing future care and maintenance of those ponds. At this particular juncture, if North Village is considered to be its own entity, as South Village, which they can be under our declarations, they can be separate HOAs, but there are financial contributions in terms of fees for reserves to keep these things up and to maintain all of the, those common elements. Based upon what I've seen so far, there's none of that. There is no, and one of the comments made by um, one of the folks representing Ballantine Development made a comment, or I think it might have been Carrie, that, yeah, I, I'm going to take care of everything. It's all part of North Village, but it's not. This is impactful to the entire community. And unless we have an agreement in place, not only for how these ponds are going to be handled during the project, but once the project is completed on how we are going to collaborate to make sure we have the finances, we understand what the commitment is in terms of what the plan is and execute against it. If we don't do that, it's gonna be unfortunately the burden of the Eastern Village homeowners to have to deal with that particular situation. Not quite a great deal. The other point I want to make, and I'm not trying to be disparaging to anyone, in phases two, three, and four of Eastern Village, there's a lot of stuff that still needs to get done. Understanding that there are some things that can't be done, for instance, we can't pay federal way because of construction traffic, that's been a longstanding knowledge and agreement. But there's work that needs to get done. Our experience thus far is that work doesn't get done when there's other things that are involved, that work gets pushed to the side. We have phases 5A and 5 that are under construction. There needs to be a plan in place that says when the construction is done, you have X amount of time to finish all of that infrastructure that needs to be there. 
If we don't do that, we're going to experience exactly what was experienced when I moved to the neighborhood in 2015, where things that for phase one and phase two that needed to be done were still years that they had been waiting for. We're trying to be a community with Cary, with Ballantyne Development. I fear right now there's an adversarial relationship that's been complete, that's been put together, because anytime the homeowners are not quite in favor of what's being done, it just enhances that adversarial relationship. We need to come together with you as the planning board, with Ballantyne Development, with Ballantyne Place, and with the homeowners of Eastern Village, and work to resolve these problems and put solutions in place that work for everyone. Because if this is going to be a real community, and Scarbo's going to really look at this and say this is a great showcase of a community, then that's the only thing that will get us there. Otherwise, we're going to keep having these meetings, we're going to keep having these discussions, and if at some point this gets approved and we still have this dissent, then we're, we're really, we're kind of done. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Portia Hirschman. I live at 8 Inspiration and I will look across the street at those buildings. So I appreciate, first of all, the changes in the colors and the roofs. Um, and I really appreciate the change in terms of Ward Street. So thank you for that. Um, I come here tonight to <clears throat> support the abutters on Ballantyne and looking at building or at number seven and number 14. If you look closely at the drawing that was shown, it's 130 feet from the front door of Seven Camden to the back door of Robert's building, of his home, 130 feet. That's pretty darn close. Um, and he will be looking somewhat at all those, uh, all those apartments. His home value, I think, is, is affected. In fact, there is a house, 8 Richards Way, over um, next to South Village, that was, complete, was started, actually, um, before South Village was completed almost a year and a half, two years, it still hasn't sold. People don't want to look at a parking lot. They don't want to look at a building full of renters. Um, I understand the, the house is being rented, but this is going to affect property values. The other thing is the porches, the deck areas on seven, look down on Robert's backyard, uh, and that's from the third floor, and you can't build a berm that high. So I ask you, what, what, what would it be like if this was your backyard? And the second thing I have, and I've, this will be a number of times that I've been here, is finish phases two through four. And the more that things get left undone, the longer the list is. Ironically, the developer claims that context is important, that village atmosphere is important, and yet fails to understand that street trees and sidewalks and working street lights are important. They contribute to the environment in which we live. He sells a vision but where is the fulfillment of that vision? In addition, he has used the phrase consistent with Eastern Village when it suits him. For example, he's refusing to apply the same standard in, Southern, in uh, South Village for outside units that he requires of Eastern Village homeowners. He demands foundation plantings of Eastern Village homeowners, but there are no foundation plantings that I've seen called for and they certainly aren't in South Village. Can he so uh, reserve noncompliance for himself despite what he enforces for us? The bottom line is that Eastern Village homeowners are the ones who have to live with the consequences of whatever you decide, intended and unintended. The developer does not live in the neighborhood, we do. We pay HOA fees, we're liable for special assessments, our taxes have gone up recently, surprise, due to the reappraisals. But I doubt that they were done with the understanding of North Village's impact on our neighborhood. We were sold a village uh, vision, and we have a vested interest in preserving that, that um, neighborhood. So thank you again for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you.
Good evening. My name is Rick Hirschman. I live at 8 Inspiration Drive. I'm Porsche's husband. We look directly from the front of our house into this development. Um, I've attended a number of the uh, planning board meetings, and I'm going to shorten this because other people have said the same thing. But I haven't heard a whole lot of comments from the planning board about this development as to whether it is appropriate for the neighborhood. There have been some questions about it, but not really much discussion. It seems like what we're trying to do, uh, and, and I, I, I want to be on. I, I want to be favorable to the planning board. I'm not, you know, upset with you particularly, but I would like to. to it seems like what you're doing, the planning board is doing, is shoehorning a bad development into a nice development, and I just do not understand it. It is that. I, uh, Jim Houle sent a, a, a letter in which he quoted the ordinance that, that talks about site review. And, this, and site review is to be sure that it is a suitable development and not result in a detriment to the community. And this, as planned, is going to do that. It was mentioned earlier, and I'd like to reemphasize it, that if Building 7 and Building, I, is it Building 14, were moved to Lot 25, you would solve about 90% of the problems. And, not, and building whatever that, that lot is, it's over there next to the word Santec at the top there, that, that huge lot over there. It's a dry land, and it's my understanding it's going to be, um, what's the word, uh, dedicated to a um, permanent situation where nobody can build on it. If you did that with this end of the development and moved those buildings over there, it's, you know, you'd solve a huge chunk of problems. The pictures that were done with A, B, C, and D were in a completely different focus photographically from the other pictures, and you'll notice that none of them go to Robert Moog's house, none of them go to any of the houses on Ballantyne, even though they are somewhat distorted views. I also have a concern about uh, the ponds, um, I, I apologize, but Barbara had the colors wrong. Virtually all of those, with the exception of the light purple, are either going into Ballantyne or Eastern Pond. And something needs to be decided about that as to who is responsible for that. Uh, because eventually those are going to belong, uh, Ballantyne Pond belongs to Ballantyne. And Eastern uh, Trail Pond, or whatever it's called, is going to belong to Eastern Village. Um, I would just hope that you, you do, you, well, you will do the right thing, I'm sure, but please uh, notice, you, you've noticed that there are a lot of people from Eastern Village that come to these meetings. I've been to a lot of these meetings, and a lot of the meetings, uh, none of the meetings have I ever seen as many people show up. And it's not just because we're big complainers, it's because we have real, real deep concerns about this development. Thank you, uh, and I, I do want to thank you for your service to the community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carolyn Inglis, and I live at 4 Traditional Street. As my husband Jim and I were investigating whether we wanted to build in Eastern Village or not, Carrie Anderson could have been more enthusiastic, welcoming, flexible, gracious. That all ended as soon as our building had been completed. Um, frankly, uh, to look back on his treatment of us over a many month period takes courage on our part. I do not use that term lightly courage for his intimidation, his yelling, his insulting, his threats to rip things up. I mean, it, it's, wow, this is where we plan to spend our retirement. And uh, it's been very, very difficult, not just for us, but other people in Eastern Village. Let's be clear, North Village is solely for Carrie's benefit. He whines some about the costs. And if he has to change this or that, it will mean it's not really worth building. It just won't it'd be too huge a problem. Well, I say, well, doesn't a building budget 
have a portion for cushion for when things come up. They always come up in any kind of building situation, but he cries poor. Um, were he to build duplexes, townhouses, single family homes, or even apartments that are a full story lower than what he's proposing, a lot of this angst would dissipate we could feel more part of a community instead of looking at the behemoth the way we do when we come in and see South Village. I know people who won't come in the entrance from Eastern Road because it's so appalling for them to think this is where they're going to their home. And it's such an affront. He said, oh, we gave plans forever, for years, but he changed things along the way, many things along the way, without conferring. And of course, he used the dog park as a diversion we have a dog park, people get, oh, great. Well, well, if you have a dog and look at the measurements of this park, how many dogs can be in there before there are dog fights, they get thirsty, need water, uh, they're not cleaned up after, there's no place for owners to sit or park. It's all about him and his profit margin. And I say we've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in our homes, and we're seeing it fade the glory of our neighborhood fading because of the man who sold us a story about planned neighborhood that would be more than gracious to all. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jim Inglis live at four traditional street and uh, hope you understand why I've been married 53 years to that woman. <laughs> uh, the proposal uh, has significant problems. I refer you as uh, was previous to Jim Hool's letter to the board, which I think is uh, quite eloquent and quite clear in its concerns about whether North Village as landscaped and as, archi you know, as architecture and its landscape, whether it should even be built. And I think there's a serious and uh, sensible argument that is made about raising that very question. A couple of things, uh, there's some internal inconsistencies in what he's put up, and actually you've seen some of them, uh, uh, one of them uh, previously. The landscaping plan, he, there are several different versions of it that have been shown. Uh, one of the biggest differences is one of them shows uh, landscaping, this one around lot 140, there's some buffering there. Another picture shows no landscaping buffering around lot 140. Which is it? Uh, uh, yeah, that's the one that shows. And there's no landscaping buffering there. Okay? If you look at those pictures uh, as they were described, when I look at those pictures, I says, boy, there's practically no uh, uh, you know, protection, landscaping protection by those stands of trees. There's nothing there that provides any additional protection. Again, showing the need and the emphasis for a serious buffering, a serious several rows of buffering, a berm, all the way around covering all the properties. It's not just for the landowners, it's for people who are walking along Ballantyne and Inspiration, that they don't have to look uh, as they look between houses and look between properties at uh, uh, Northern Village. Please that, uh, that the, uh, uh, there will be a fire gate at the end of uh, Camden, but Valentine, please make sure that it fully covers the opening there and that uh, question of who has the key and access. So there aren't, you know, lots of concerns about people either trying to get around that, construction people getting around it, or uh, trying to make exceptions and open it for, for various, uh, uh, you know, unnecessary reasons. Okay. Okay. Uh, the general point is about, uh, I'll support that entire uh, footprint needs to be moved away. We've proposed several things that, that could be done, uh, there, and I won't go over those because there's a new one that's arisen, and that's move a significant portion of the project across Ward Street onto that lot 25, which looks like an easy building lot, an easy place to put a significant portion, which would solve, as has been pointed out, a significant number of these lines, or maybe you put it this way, it allows the opportunity to solve a lot of these landscaping buffering problems. Thank you. Thank you.
Do we have any other public comments this evening? Hi, I'm Nancy Pack. Uh, I live at 7 Inspiration Drive. Um, I'll be brief because many of the comments made by the neighbors are uh, hearing several themes come up uh, time and time again. I think, you know, f for someone that does a lot of strategic planning and long term planning, not per, uh, per se in real estate, uh, but in business, um, it would be really interesting if we can actually see a proposed plan that has part of the development on lot 25. So you know, you're hearing from the community, it would be nice to consider that and you know, what would that look like, but for actually for, uh, for the community to see a proposal, so you know, uh, drawn out uh, architectural plans, landscaping, what would that look like? So we have what's proposed here and we do see you know, some improvements uh, proposed on um, uh, you know, color of buildings and some things where progress has been made, but to actually see this is what this looks like what would it look like if you have seven and 14, you know, not where it's proposed, but how about picking a piece of that up? Here's what that plan looks like, architecturally, landscape, and otherwise. Then you can compare and we can discuss the pros and cons. Um, the developer can present, you know, what's good and bad about that, and the community can give feedback. So I just argue and, and implore that we actually see what that might look like and we understand the pros and cons before the, the project would uh, progress further. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Janice Cohen and I'm at 27 Inspiration. Um, I just wanted to, what you have is a lot of facts, a lot of facts, information from the developer, a lot from the neighborhood. And I'm always impressed that this neighborhood can come up with, spend that much time and learn what the ins and outs of the development are and how it could be improved and how it could be improved if we trust the developer, that we would work with him and with Ballantyne Development to make this the neighborhood that we were promised. And I want to just say a minute, you have a very important job here. Scarborough is growing faster, I think, than any community in Maine. This isn't going to be the first one. It hasn't been the first one. It won't be the last one that you're going to have to make these hard decisions. How you may help to manage the growth of this community will tell the quality of life we all have here. So it's a big job, and it's important that when you are doing that job, you take in consideration what you want this community to look like. And who are the people you're going to work with, the developers that are going to help this community be what it wants to be? So I think we're at a point right now in Scarborough with the growth we're having that we really need to look at this, not just what a developer wants to develop and what is in their best interest to develop, but what is good for the community. So I encourage you to look at this and to see how the community itself has to be part of the decision making, not just the developer. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. I have a couple notes I wanted to cover and I think it's a good time for me to speak. My name is Terry Willette and um, I am the property manager at South Village, which we've heard a lot about tonight, um, which is the uh, rental units that are on the other side of um, this neighborhood. And when we talk about who this benefits and talking about North Village, I can tell you that we are at 100% occupancy at South Village. We have a waiting list um, for many of the units, corner units, first floor units, handicapped accessible units. Um, there is a need in this community for affordable residency. There are people who live here who want to stay here. They can't afford some of the lovely homes that these folks live in. Um, I talk a little bit about the tenants because I know them and I know who's going to be going into North Village. So they'll be very much like the folks that are at South Village. So we have firemen, we have police officers, I have a pharmacist assistant, I have an air traffic controller, I have a special education teacher. Um, I, I can't help, I guess I'm trying not to be upset about it because I don't want to take it personally, but I feel like if this was, we talked about um, townhomes or single family homes, 
that if these people, if he was building something that people were going to buy instead of rent, a lot of the people would be okay with it. And so I'm just a little bit concerned about that because we've talked a lot about, and I don't even know where that parcel is, their lot 25, but I feel like a lot of people want to move something over there. So it's like not literally like not in my backyard. So I just want people to think about what it is that we need for housing because a lot of the folks that have come to us have been from Scarborough and they've come back from college or they're here to start their career or they've gotten a divorce and they want to stay in the community and they cannot afford to purchase. So there is a need, I can tell you that. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, and then the, other, the only other concern that I wanted to mention is a lot of talk has been about the size of these buildings. And we have townhouses in Eastern Village. They're 42 feet high. These buildings, these rental buildings, are going to be 45 feet. So what goes for a townhouse that sells for $400,000 to $500,000, if you go four feet higher, but it's for rentals, that's not what anybody wants to look at. The comments tonight have been, we want a buffer so that when we're walking along um, Ballantyne and Inspiration, that we can't see, even see those buildings, that they exist between the houses. But all of you look at the townhouses as you're walking through the neighborhood. And then the only other point that I want to make is that I was involved in Eastern Village, I'm not any more in the same level, but when this neighborhood was first um, conceived, it was the whole point of a traditional neighborhood development is that you have high density homes that are very close to each other with vertical scale, which if any of you have driven through, you'll agree all of your homes are in vertical scale, they're very close. The point of the porches and the common spaces are so that the houses are closely located and then people will, you know, I guess, gather together in um, common spaces. And I'm not really sure why there's so much opposition to the rentals other than for the reasons that I've mentioned earlier. Um, because the whole idea of the neighborhood is that it's a mixed use. We have small cottage lots, very small 800 square foot houses, and then we have very large houses. The point of the neighborhood was to have diversity. So I'm not sure why so much opposition is to this kind of diversity, other than the differences is that one is home ownership and one is renting. So I guess I would just end by saying that there is a huge need. Um, and so when you talk about who's going to benefit and whether it's Carrie or the developer, I can tell you who's going to benefit. There are a lot of people that want to live in this community and they can't afford to do so. And we're desperate for workforce housing. And this is exactly what this will provide. So thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to, I'm going to ask you to refrain until everyone's had a chance to make their comments. Uh, no, I, I, I want to get this out because no, I think it goes. Excuse me. It, excuse me. Excuse me. I'm going to ask the rest of the crowd if there's guys, anyone else, if there's anyone else that would like to speak. Anybody? And I'm also going to ask you to make sure you direct any comments to the chair. Oh, absolutely. To keep I, this as civil a proceeding as possible. Please understand. Thank you. Please understand. Can we have your name again, please? Paul Sorrentino. Thank you. I want to make a couple of points here so that you guys have something very, very clear. The opposition to North Village isn't the difference between renters as though they are some lower form of life than homeowners. It has nothing to do with that. We understand the need for affordable housing. Is $1,500 a month affordable? I guess the sum it is. But I don't think this needs to be painted as an us against them, that the Eastern Village homeowners are somehow aghast that renters would be there. That's not the issue. The issue is we have a community. We have a community that was built on a vision. And what we're doing now is taking that vision and saying, the public versus private way that I've talked to Carrie many times about and what people can see from the public vein. How is that not important now, but it's important for Eastern Village homeowners to make sure that their air conditioning units and everything is covered up? Because Carrie doesn't want to see that in the public way. So how is it okay that we have 45 foot buildings, 130 feet from someone's home, and that's acceptable? And I appreciate the fact that South Village has some great people living there. A lot of great people, a lot of great jobs. 
But we also have trouble with the people that live there. And I'm not going to call them renter. They're people. They're human beings who happen to live there that don't necessarily have the same level of respect for our community as we do. I get that. But it's not because they're renters. They're not a lower form of life. And that's not what this is all about. And if you think that that's what this is all about, then you've got it all wrong. We want to preserve Eastern Village as a community, the community that we all bought into. We understand the need for different types of housing. No one's arguing that point. What we're looking at is how do we do this in a way that's cooperative and collaborative and everybody wins. Thank you. Can refrain from applauding that'd be great thank you is there anyone else here that wants to approach the podium okay seeing none I'm going to close public comment at this time and uh, I'm just gonna quickly uh, I'm gonna say a couple things uh, first of all I want to say thank you to everyone that showed up you have uh, some incredibly thoughtful um, and very important questions that need to be hashed out. I think that fact that you've taken the time to come here and speak with us um, speaks a lot about your community. So I'll start there, say I appreciate it, I really do. Uh, I have a clarifying question real quick. Um, there was something that came up during conversation. I wanted to check with staff on the common area maintenance agreement is that something that you've seen where a developer has attempted to turn over certain aspects of enforcement of some sort of rules on a property to the town for responsibility? Jay, Angela, so, Jamel, either? Not Any? that I, I'm not aware of that, no. Okay. From my perspective, I don't know if you guys have in else a, to And Jamel, I think you've had more um, direct conversations, but our town attorney did take a look at the maintenance agreement or um, however it was framed and had some comments and um, had some issues that we needed to work through. So um, it has been reviewed by the town's attorney and has, wasn't found to be acceptable to the town yet. Okay, thank you. That said, um, I will start. Uh, there's a lot here. So, Jen. Congratulations, you were the lucky winner for tonight's <laughs> planning board lottery. Okay. Um, I too would like to thank anyone that's come and offered comments and also sent ahead your comments. That's helpful for us. Um, and it's not easy for a lot of you, so I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> I have a question. Um, uh, I guess just quickly, and, uh, and thank you, Carrie, for recognizing comments from the last meeting and taking a look at how the construction access to this site will be facilitated. I think um, that was definitely an issue of a lot, you know, a lot of concern to a lot of people previously, and so um, I'm, I'm glad that you were able to make that work out. Um, on the topic of the fire gate that will be installed, I, you had made reference to the fact that that would be in for the duration of um, construction and that it would be at the town's discretion about whether or not that came out afterwards. Is that correct? We will put it up and we will leave it up as long as the town says leave it up. And I heard that they didn't want traffic out on the Ballantyne Drive, so Presumably, they want it left up as long as possible. I think the town probably wants it left up as short as possible. Pick one. Okay. So um, I'm, I have sort of like mixed thoughts about that, but generally I do think that um, it's a good idea given the roadway design and the sense of the neighborhood um, to keep construction access off of Ward Street for the duration of construction. but. Um, having once lived in a neighborhood with a gate that was locked, and I don't know the reason that that was installed, but it was sort of like a cross arm gate with a with a padlock and a chain on one end of it, <clears throat> and it was there far beyond. There was no active construction or anything, but it linked um, 
pedestrian access between two neighborhoods. And so what happened was over time people, this was a strong desire line, and so people just ended up walking around the two sides and it was very worn down and muddy in the spring and difficult in the winter. And so I guess I would just give um, just the comment that the particular design of that gate should be looked at in terms of what the intent is to barrier, um, if it is to be there over a long period of time, um, if it's just purely for construction, limiting construction vehicle access um, to an otherwise active construction site, then sort of a more robust gate would make sense to me. But um, and the other the other piece of that comment has to do with some of the traffic comments, which I'll get to um, in a minute. But the um, you know, from a network standpoint and the way that this project actually, your overall project, you're sort of fortunate in the, you know, you're able to connect into a number of different roads in a number of different ways. And so blocking that access, uh, again, beyond the duration of the construction, I just think would have kind of a detrimental effect on the ability for this development and the development that's already there to sort of help disperse some of that traffic. It, for example, would prevent anyone from um, the established neighborhood from using Ward Street to get up to, to Route 1 and um, vice versa. If someone was heading to the south, they would then have to go up to Route 1 and come through the Oak Hill intersection. So um, just some thoughts there about preserving connectivity in the future. Um, I save that for lighting folks. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to your thoughts about the lot 25 that's come up from a number of um, folks here tonight and I'm sure that you have thoughts about it and obviously the um, the residents here do as well and so just just curious what your long-term plans are for that. We don't have uh, plans for it right now. It, um, it's a different parcel, slightly different zoning, not as liberal bulk in space, uh, located away from infrastructure and from a road network that we're putting in, isn't in our DEP permit that we waited nine months to get, um, is a whole, it's basically starting from scratch, um, full of ledge, has six to eight percent grade, I don't know, I could probably find some other things, but those are just things that kind of come to mind. So no, uh, no plans for development, even if that's just you saying maybe someday plans for development? I'm sure it'll be developed at some point in the future, but I don't have plans right now. No. Okay. Understood. Um, <clears throat> on the, um, I do have a couple of comments related to the traffic issues. Um, there was some conflicting information about whether or not the Black Point Eastern Road intersection was actually a high crash location. Um, it sounds as though tonight that was spoken in that way, but the material that was submitted um, says otherwise. I think I did a quick check on DET, DOT's website, um, and it does appear to be a high crash location. So I'm curious about why um, there's no, or just what, what are you, are, are there any suggestions by this development on how to help address that? Uh, Steve Bushy with uh, Grove Palmer. We evaluated that a couple of years ago for the South Village and, and so a couple of the recommendations that were set forth at that time uh, because of the accident pieces uh, were put in place and that was a speed limit reduction and uh, a little change in the signs and suggested they have some larger signs as well as uh, moving uh, uh, advanced signs closer to the intersection because it was felt that people just weren't keying in on the fact that when somebody pushes the, the push button. Uh, I don't know if additional information for those using the push button flashers was installed. That was a recommendation as well uh, because some of the accidents were indicative of somebody pushing the button and immediately feeling that they had the opportunity to cross the road, not looking both ways. Uh, so to that, we're not really sure uh, that the burden clearly lies entirely uh, with this development. Uh, the traffic 
information that we've picked up thus far shows that predominantly it's for through traffic on Black Point Road, not the side turning traffic since that volume is so low. Now to, uh, again, the point that I made earlier that the town engineer has asked for, um, I guess, our opinion uh, from Goral Palmer as to the uh, warrants for a traffic signal, because I believe there's some sense from uh, the local folks that what a traffic signal, and we know that we hear that often about the use of a traffic signal, and unfortunately it's just not that simple about being able to uh, put in a signal to uh, satisfy a particular issue or not. So we'll respond to that piece of it, um, but beyond that, that's... But so, so there was no additional analysis following some of those improvements that were made after 2016 or 18, I think you were saying, the, the last memo that was included with this material about signage improvements, speed limit reduction, things like that. No, this development hasn't gone on to study whether or not any of those were effective and whether or not um, there may be additional recommendations associated with this build out. What I can't speak to is the timing of a couple of the things. Like, I don't know when the speed limit was reduced on Black Point Road, if that was just recently or not. I, I should know I'm on Black Point Road enough, but uh, I, I know that it's now 35. Uh, as far as the signage relocation, I'd have to speak to maybe DPW. I'm not sure if Angela knows when some of those things might have been uh, implemented. Uh, so. Uh, one of the recommendations that came up was the um, advanced warning lit signs, um, and those have not been installed yet. That was one of the things um, that I think Carrie paid towards as part of South Village. Those have not been installed yet. Um, but that was the only one I think that was remaining. Okay. Um, I guess, you know, the, the memo that was included here um, that outlined some of those recommendations, I thought read like a pretty good um, list of suggestions that obviously still remain and seemed reasonable given this, um, this type of development and the fact that, that it will be connecting out onto um, to Black Point Road. So um, I guess I would just, you know, encourage continued conversation on some of those items, particularly the speed study. I think that would be interesting to, to understand whether or not that drop in speed limit has had an impact on accidents or not. Um, <clears throat> and maybe a, a speed feedback sign, which was also recommended in your um, the material submitted. One thing that I wasn't quite able to figure out, I don't know if you can speak to offhand or provide later, but the number of how many trips or particularly probably PM peak hour trips that this part of the development would be contributing at that Black Point Eastern Road intersection? Uh, I couldn't speak to exactly the distribution. The expectation is that predominantly the folks on North Village would be using the Ward Street because it would make mm -hmm. more common sense that they have the ability to use uh, the signalized intersection for access to Route 1. Uh, certainly, if somebody's going to the beach uh, or Black Point, where have you, right. they're going to take the Eastern Road, I would expect, and go that direction. But otherwise, it's pretty hard to believe that many people needing to take a left uh, onto Black Point Road, which is a tough movement, yeah. uh, no doubt, uh, where they'd have the ability to just go out Ward Street and take a right, free right off of a signalized intersection or wait for the signal, so. Sure, I guess I was just curious about what that, what that um, distribution would look like and whether or not that's been, um, been looked at. Um, that's the fire gate. Um, I think that's the, the bulk of my comments. Again, also appreciate the design work that's gone on thus far to um, connect this development with um, Route 1 pedestrian facilities. I think that'll be a great enhancement to, to this area for all, all of you and those that will come to live here in the future. Thank you, Jeff. Rob? Mixing it up tonight, Mr. Chair. Curve balls for everyone. All right. Um, <clears throat> what year was the stormwater pond built? Which one? Um, the one that will in Ballantyne, yeah. The one in Ballantyne? 
The one in Ballantyne was originally built in 2003. It had improvements in 2010, I believe, or 11. <coughs> Further improvements uh, after that. And that's where it stands. Has it been, uh, do you have an executed agreement for a third party person to look at that and take care of that? What am I, Angela? We, I'm sure we do through our DEP permit, yes. The other thing I'd point out about the Ballantyne Pond is we're not sending any post development there. It's all, it's all existing watershed. So there's no extra water going there as a result of this project, I don't believe. Okay, so the water's going where from this development? Thanks, Jamal. So we have various colors here. Uh, we are actually reducing the amount of watershed area going to Ballantyne and redirecting uh, the bulk of the area that's being developed to the new, what we've defined as the eastern uh, village wet pond, which is the new pond off the eastern road. Yeah, the one at that's the, at the bottom at of the, the bottom, grade. At the south side of the site. Correct. When was that one built? That was built in uh, approximately 2014. Okay. 13, 14. Does that one have an executed post construction inspection and maintenance? Correct. Okay. Yes. So okay. we're going through and doing the inspections and have to do the five year and certification. And it has had a recent five year certification done? Uh, I believe we did one last year. Okay. In fact, 2019. Okay. Um, do we have a D, be considering the proximity to environmentally sensitive areas, we have a DEP stormwater inspector on site, correct? Uh, I, third party inspection, right? I just got a report a couple of days ago, in fact. You did? Yeah. Okay. Um, is everything, is everything, were there any violations identified on that report? Not to my knowledge. I'll allow Angela to weigh in on that, but I'm not uh, familiar with there being any particular uh, outstanding issues right now. Okay. I guess where, where I'm going with this is um, these, these stormwater features need attention. Um, and I just wanted to make sure they were getting attention. But just like we have an executed post-construction agreement for the stormwater features, our, our rules do say in chapter 405B, section 5F9A, that a written maintenance plan shall be provided for the landscape elements to be installed on the site. The plan shall include initial installment, guarantee period, replacement policy, annual maintenance and irrigation provisions. I guess I would like to see that um, put together as part of the staff's request too for a phasing plan. Uh, be updated so that we're aware of all the different phases and what's happening and you know sort of what the lingering requirements may be um, and this is you know as as some of the landowners have mentioned this is a, a very um, this is a very precarious time in Scarborough as far as growth is concerned and when you have these large large uh, phase developments like this, it's hard to keep track of everything. And so we are asking a lot of the large developers now to provide us with aggregate tables and, and charts to say this is how much, you know, our land is in aggregate. This is how much that's been disturbed. And this is how much wetland impact there's been to date and how much expe expected. I'm going to stop there for just a mi minute because I guess what I'm asking for, but you guys get what I'm asking for is I'm supporting the staff's re recommendation for a, an updated uh, phase um, plan. And the, the landscape plan should be part of that robust plan of we know, so that we know where we're going with this. Um, the Army Corps permit, has, has the fee been paid yet for the Army Corps permit? I don't believe not the yet. Has been okay. Paid yet. So we're not Only holding anything up. We're, we're waiting for the right. approvals. So we're not holding anything up. I guess is what I wanted to to say that we can't necessarily disturb any area here until all the permits are in hand. 
So with that said, I'd like to pause and say that we have a little bit of time to, to make sure that our very busy staff has everything that they need. Um, and as, as Jennifer had mentioned, you know, their, their, their memo is a pretty good roadmap to, to what needs to be done. And, and I pretty much support staff on all of these other things in here, the common areas maintenance agreement. I wouldn't want to necessarily move forward on that and, until staff has talked with legal counsel. And if this is a first of its kind, all the more reason I think to pause and look at that. Um, staff is also saying on the bottom of page three that we should have um, an MOU for um, the proposed right of way. They're also saying that the public easement for the proposed nature trail should be in place. And so I, I would like to propose that we pause here for that. And also, Steve, you had mentioned that the town had asked you to look into some type of traffic analysis there. You, there was still something there that was hanging. Can you remind me? I just wrote, town asked for analysis, and I put it for under For Eastern traffic. Road and Black Point Road, yeah. that intersection. Yeah. So our response had been, well, we looked at it a couple of years ago. And okay. It, uh, so, updating that, I can report that, in fact, yeah, there remains still a mm -hmm. uh, high critical rate and it's still a high accident location. And the uh, accident history that I've looked at basically shows the same thing that we saw three years ago. Which so, you're was, saying your work is done for that kind of thing? Like to say so, yes. Okay. Um, I'm not the traffic expert. I'll, I'll leave it to other people, but I, I do feel like there's. <laughs> I understand that there's a fairly high uh, traffic impact fee associated here, but again, anybody who's gone to Black Point Road understands that there's a pretty high impact there, period. Um, I think when, when you work with the town to develop that updated phase plan, you should really think about the buffers and all the buffering ideas that we had here today uh, need to be taken into consideration. Um, no, I'm forgetting something. If I could just interrupt and add one piece relative to back mm -hmm. to the stormwater. Uh, I'll note that we do have a signed agreement as well with a third party vendor for the maintenance of this site. Okay. Uh, and specifically because we have porous pavement, which mm -hmm. requires some special uh, uh, maintenance requirements, vacuuming of that porous yep. pavement. We actually have a signed and executed agreement, which the DEP had required of us. Yeah. So. That sounds good. I know I'm, I'm forgetting something, Steve and Carrie. I apologize, so I'll just defer to my, my colleagues. Thank you, Robin. Rick Meinking. Hmm. All right. I guess I'm known as the, the lighting guy, so I'm going to talk about lighting here. The photometrics was really tough to follow and it almost seems like it, it's moved. One of the things that I look for in a photometric plan is the ratio of maximum to minimum. There's a, usually a table and I didn't see that and I'm concerned about the uniformity of what I see on this plan. So I would, I would strongly urge uh, my colleagues to support a, um, a schedule, a table that uh, indicates these uniformities so that we can just look at it and know that it's, it's within the um, guidelines. You're a little, you're, in some areas, you're really dark in some of the parking lots. And so that's why I thought kind of it moved. So take a look at that. I didn't see it being done by anybody. Uh, it's just a take. It's just a print. Jim and, Stockman down in Kennebunk. And usually you want to kind of put some sort of credence to the to the plan with somebody's name or a firm that did it. Um, curious as to why you're using a 400 K light on the um, garages and it's 300k on the street lights and in the parking lot lights. So now you're going to have two different colors that you might want to consider having some uniformity to that. Um, can you just review your timers versus sensors? Um, 
you mentioned timers, and I'm wondering if is that the mechanical type um, clock timer, yes. or is it? Yeah, that's got the human element in it, and that's that doesn't always work well. And I would I would default to sensors versus timers. You mean like eyes? Yeah, photo photo eyes. Uh, the, so, the best of all worlds is to have some sort of um, uh, control system that you can program different uh, outputs of your light at different times of the, the night and, <coughs> and as it goes into dusk, and then you can ramp things down. And then you have the sensor on there that if a car pulled in, it kind of brings them back up so that you can get into your apartment and then things settle back down. Um, the Bullards don't appear to be um, full cutoff. You, the way they, they appear on your cut sheet is they're a bollard with a round light, so it's all coming out, but a full cutoff will have louvers on it so it goes down, so it's not going up. So I take a look at those because I think our ordinance requires them to be full cutoff um, on that. So those are my lighting comments. Um, last time I mentioned it would be great to have some EV chargers in, in the complex, and you said, yeah, we can make that happen, and I didn't see any annotation on the plans of such. They're in the garages? Uh, I didn't see which garages they were put in. Uh, but that's nice. Uh, if you can show that on future plan, that would be that would be helpful. Um, the I had one more. Yes, the handicapped parking between buildings 21 and 29 are pulled down away from the entrance of that building 21, and was wondering why those are down there, not closer to the entry of building 21. Um, well, I know we, do you to know on that, Sean? I know we've got the accessibles and, uh, yeah, we can flip those. Okay. Um, I'll just close by saying I do appreciate, I feel like there's a little bit more compromising going on here, uh, between, uh, the developer and the the community that's going to live there, and I'm 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 hopeful that can continue as we um, get through some of these what I consider some significant um, items to to check off the list. But I appreciate the construction going through Ward Street and uh, shutting off the the traffic flow for you as as the the citizens of that area. And I appreciate all you coming out here and talking about this because I think that's how we solve um, hurdles or obstacles. We, we try to come up with a sensible compromise, and I think we're getting there. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about that vacant lot and see if there was a way to uh, uh, move building, uh, I think it's seven, uh, away from some of those close abutters. Uh, but with that, Chair, I'll... Uh... Mr. Chairman, can I make a comment about that? Yes. So one thing that's happened in all of this is we're getting further and further away from what Eastern Village was always intended to be. And that was a mixed building, mixed use, mix income, mix this, mix that inside the neighborhood. And this is all about the type of use over here. Make no mistake about it, despite what they say. We could have, and we would be allowed to put townhouse buildings that are larger than our apartment buildings, like number seven, up to five feet off the back property line of that homeowner on 136 and 137. And that'd be a totally acceptable bulk in space, setbacks, height, everything else, size, everything else, use. But somehow or other, a building that's 130 feet away that's smaller in scale isn't acceptable. Berms, all these other things, that's an exclusive neighborhood, not an inclusive neighborhood. That's a segregated neighborhood, not an integrated neighborhood like Eastern Village was always intended to be. This is all about use. 
and the more that we continue to go in that direction the more we're going against everything that eastern village was always intended to be thank you um, rachel yeah i've um let's take a look at a couple of relatively from my opinion at least minor things and then i've got something a little more major to tackle with you uh in prior meetings uh prior hearings i did suggest that the dog park have benches places for the neighbors to sit while their dogs were inside that and i don't see that there have been any changes there is that still um is that a possibility uh yeah i don't see a problem with that okay the uh i do want to address the question of uh, landscaping around the parking areas and the attorney has left okay uh, it, you need to take a look at the requirements and basically any parking area does not need the island with the landscaping unless the run is more than 10 spaces that said I don't see uh, I don't see anything that uh, would prevent you from putting in some plantings, not trees, but plantings around the parking areas to screen at least uh, at, the, at the eye level or to appear to break up some of the concrete, uh, the asphalt as folks are looking at that. So I would suggest that as you're looking at your landscaping, some low gardens uh, with um, relatively easy care plantings would be very helpful around those parking areas could you point out where you're talking about well along the certainly along the edge of the parking lot i think it's building seven and the parking lot next to building 14 just we, some we low have gardens. Snow, we have snow storage areas we have to get snow out of some of these areas so we have snow storage locations for some of those um you don't, you don't you're not talking about in those areas are you uh, i can i'm looking at a star i'm looking at c60 the landscape. the landscape plan and i'm not sure that i can't tell if that's a snow storage area or not okay uh, uh, so I, i'm suggesting again it, it's a different way to break up granted it doesn't screen but it does break up the appearance of the parking lot I would like to um, also commend you on the, the changes that you've done in the architecture in terms of the, the, uh, the colors. I think a charcoal gray roof um, ensures that the building does not stand out quite as starkly as it might with a, a red roof. Uh, the change to the taupe, and I think there was, I saw a Monterey taupe and a cobblestone with the names of, of the colors, um, that does help. It, it really does, and I appreciate the work and the, the thought that's gone into that. Uh, I appreciate the work that's been done to respond to the issues that folks had around construction traffic. Uh, I, I do think at some point the gate needs to go uh, at the end of Camden Street because the neighbors are going to want to use Ward Street. But a couple of the, the issues that I've heard again and again from the neighbors, um, one of them appears in the staff comments on page two, uh, where it says, it appears that the applicant is planning to construct and occupy this phase of the Eastern Village subdivision prior to completing prior phases actively under construction. We asked you uh, earlier in this process to outline for us where some of the construction work had been going forward, what had been accomplished, what was the planning. Uh, since that meeting, which I believe was sometime last year, um, is there anything that you've completed that we didn't know about, that you didn't talk to us about at that time? All the work along Eastern Road was completed, the sidewalk coming down Eastern Road, the uh, 
landscaping around South Village, the sidewalks around South Village, the sodding around South Village, uh, the tree installation around South Village. Uh, the parking lot areas behind townhouses in phase three and four were completed. Um, the only thing that's not completed right now in phase three is the street trees and we've been asked to essentially test the soil because there was two companies that over the last couple of years have one has said the soil's high in pH, the other one has said the soil's low in pH. So we sent the soil samples up to the University of Maine, trying to get our arms around that before we put trees in. And uh, street lights, um, we just recently got the fuses to um, get installed so then the CMP can turn street lights on. And do you know when those street lights will go on? Any, you know, one month, two months? Three months? No, we waited uh, from the time we were ready for the street lights to be turned on in phase three. It took uh, 14 months. It was all in CMP's hands at the time. Right. Um, now, I, I guess the, the, the tough thing, because it's not something that's specifically written in, in the ordinances. It's not something that's written in zoning but it's something that's come up again and again, and that's a sense that Eastern Village, as it currently exists, is starting to lose its identity as a coherent whole uh, with the presence of South Village and the presence of North Village. And it's not an issue so much of architecture as it seems to me from what I've heard the folks out there talk about. It's an issue of different treatment in terms of whether it's homeowners association or whether it's whoever owns what section. Uh, and I, what I would appreciate doing is really taking a look at things like the, the homeowners association um, manuals, uh, any agreements that you have, and see if there's a way to harmonize some of those things that the folks up here have brought up, uh, whether it's the plantings, whether it's whether transformers should be uh, screened this way or that way, those very small things that create pinch points when folks start to think about community, when they see somebody on this street treated a little differently than somebody on this street, or this phase treated differently than somebody in a different phase. It's not in the ordinances. It's not in the designs. It's not in the codes. It's very much how people interact with each other in a community. And that's what I've heard consistently from the folks that have come before us. The architecture may be, you know, somebody likes white, somebody likes red, somebody likes tan. There are some things that people are never going to agree on, but I think it's possible to recreate through some of the documents the village that you envisioned when you started this that will start to bring people together, whether they're on Ballantyne Road or they're in North Village or they're in South Village. So take a look at the whole development and see where there are breakdowns in the human communication, in the interaction that are, may be exacerbated by how one group gets something or doesn't get something, uh, how one group is listened to or not listened to. And I think it's, as I said, it's, it's a human approach. It takes stepping back and thinking. Uh, I think it is very possible. I think the people in this room want to re rediscover for everybody, including the people who will come into North Village and the people in South Village, what it means to live in the community you've created, and that was your vision. So that is my appeal to you. Other than that, um, I am in uh, agreement with the uh, staff comments, uh, and I look forward to seeing this completed. I think it is going to be a benefit to the community. 
it is going to be a benefit to our workforce uh, and to the young people who are coming in. And uh, I appreciate the effort that you put into that. And I think uh, we can create a real cohesive village there. It's quite possible. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Rick Dupere. Um, no, I think everybody's done a pretty good job of covering things. There are a couple things I want to ask about. Um, Rick. Can you go over the access? Hey, Rick. Can you get your mic? Oh, thank you. Sorry. Can you go over the access again that you're going to be, how this, how this is going to be accessed during construction? Could I, I think it changed a little bit, right? You're putting a fire gate in now instead of coming, you're moving your shop. Is that what it was? Yeah. Carrie, can you grab the handheld if you're going to walk over to the plant? Thanks. Okay, so. So this is the end of Ward Street right here. We all have a shop right here. We wanted to do most of the construction from this end here, work out of that shop. Yeah. Uh, we are now going to take that shop down, do all the construction from this end, put a fire gate down here, blocking off access out onto Ballantyne Drive. Okay. So there would be a fire gate here, and all the access would come in through Ward Street, in and out of Ward Street. Okay. And then... Um, at the end, you're going to open up that that where the construction um, is going to come in out. Where you're moving your shop, this that's right going to be all finished off before. Right here. Yeah. Yeah, the, we'll we'll do that. We'll, we'll the shop will come down. We'll have to. I mean, that road will all be built now. That the shop's coming down. That that road will will be completed, completed as though was, there was nothing there. And then it wasn't mentioned tonight, but and, and I think Robin did a pretty good job of covering the stormwater stuff. But um, from the last meeting, I seem to recall there was some concern about runoff going into the backyards of the existing houses. And there's not, I don't really remember seeing a topography map, but can you kind of explain to me how that's graded? Is it, it it's graded in such a manner so that the runoff doesn't go towards the existing houses? There's a um, there's a field in there right over here. Yeah. So everything comes down this way and goes in between these two houses, down into here. It gets into the collection system. Okay. And that's all graded, and that was the berms and things that we saw that that bring that down in there. Yes, and if there's anything that needs to be done out there when we're out there, we'll be working in that area. We'll make sure that there's no water going on anybody's property. Yeah. I while you're working there anyway, I just you know, try to make sure that it's, do your best you can to make sure that it's, you know, you're not adversely affecting anybody's backyard. Um, and then I think everybody's talked about, you know, buffering and, and uh, the need for the, uh, I, I, you did, a, it looks like there's a quite a bit of buffering between that parking lot that faces the back of 137 and, um, you know, 135, 136, 137. Um, so that's good. Um, because there's that parking lot right there that faces the back of those houses. So it'd be good if that could be up um, and in before anybody starts parking there. That's all I have. Thank you, Rick. So we've had a lot of feedback um, from both the board and the community, and then from you as well, Carrie. And I will say this, um, this plan is much improved over the last version um, that was presented to us, so I appreciate the extra steps you took in order to kind of uh, shore up some of those other loose ends. Uh, I don't want to rehash uh, a lot of the discussion here. I think you've got the general uh, vibe of what we're going to be expecting, but I will highlight one area which I think the board should um, kind of weigh in on, and we've, I think we've danced around it a bit. Um, sometimes, and I don't want to assume anything, sometimes silence means, um, silence on a topic can sometimes you just assume that there's an agreement upon it. But I think one of, um, one or several of the uh, members of the community has brought up a pretty good question that has not been directly addressed. And I think, I think I'd want to hear some, 
some feedback from this board on it. And um, the, the, the overall question is, is this development appropriate for the Eastern Village neighborhood? Um, and, and I think that's a big question. Um, love to hear some feedback on that. I think it needs to be addressed um, so no one in the public is left wondering whether or not we concur that this is appropriate, whether the developer believes that this Absolutely. is appropriate. Absolutely. So I think we've got to I think we've got to take a big bite out of this tough issue. Uh, anyone want to wade into the waters first? <laughs> no. I'll, I'll jump in first, I guess. Um, I live in Scarborough. And I have a lot right next to my house that I wish I could have bought, but I couldn't afford it. Uh, right now, it's a really nice field. And my house looks right over it, and it's a beautiful thing. There's deer out there in the morning, and if I could have bought it, I would. Um, and now, eventually, there's going to be development on that lot. You know, and I sit on this board, and I, and I wish I could kind of dictate what goes in there. Um, but I can't because there's a book of codes and zoning ordinances and you know whoever buys that lot and invests that money that I didn't have is allowed to do whatever uh, meets the rules and regulations that the town set forth in the zoning ordinances and the codes. Um, you know, I feel for you, I, I really do. Um, you know, it, it sounds like some of you folks didn't know, you know, that that type of development was going to go in there. Um, and I don't know what's going to go next to my house, but um, I know that I personally, even on this board, couldn't say, oh, I don't, you know, that's not really what I wanted there because what I want there is a field <laughs> with deer in it in the morning. Um, but, you know, I don't have the money for that, so. Um, I just want to say, you know, I, I feel bad for the folks, but and I don't want to take up more than my five minutes. But, um, you know, if I was sitting over there, I'd kind of feel the same way. But sitting up here, there's, there's, uh, if the developer meets the rules and regulations, I don't know that we can say no and not get the town, you know fall into some sort of costly litigation or whatever. So um, with that, I'll leave it back to you, Chair. Thank you, Rick. Anyone else want to chime in? Rachel, go ahead. Yeah, continuing the theme, um, I, think, I think the development meets the needs of Scarborough uh, in terms of the housing that's offered. Um, I think, strangely enough, a lot of people's perceptions, uh, sometimes based on strange items of psychology or strange areas of psychology. Uh, and Gary, um, I think when you set up Southern Village or South Village, and now we've got Northern Village, those names created a, an idea that somehow or other the people there, the housing there, the development there was separate and not part of Eastern Village. And that's the psychology I'm, I'm talking about. Um, perhaps if you had named this uh, Camden Street housing, you know, anything along that line that said this is part of Eastern Village and the people who live there will be part of Eastern Village and the Eastern Village community. It might have been met slightly differently than it has been, but it's been set up to be something different. So that when that happens, simply adding five feet to the height all of a sudden becomes major. Uh, as somebody said, you know, if the townhouses uh, are only five feet lower, but that's not a problem because they're part of the, the vernacular of Eastern Village, then adding five feet in an apartment building all of a sudden makes it something 
different, something strange, something from the outside, something that no color change is actually going to deal with. The color change is nice, but it's not going to change the perception. So I go back to the need um, to work with the neighbors to find a way to make sure that South Village and Northern Village, um, North Village really is integrated into the community by the people who live there, who living or are living there, follow the same rules, whether it's dog waste uh, or parking or uh, just about anything. How, how can they get merged and integrated into the whole Eastern Village community? How can the people who live in Eastern Village come to accept that North Village is Eastern Village, South Village is Eastern Village, uh, and they are all part of the same vision? As I said from the beginning, I, I, think, it is, I think it is a development that's needed. Uh, I think there's still some more tweaking there's still some more work that can be done, but in, in the long run, I think it's something that needs to be there. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Anyone else? Go ahead, Robin. Um, the special district that was set up for this area, um, I, I know there are certain people here probably going to be probably when I say I feel like it was an experiment when we set up these you know ordinances special for this I forget what does TND stand for neighborhood district traditional um, neighborhood. they had it say it again traditional neighborhood traditional neighborhood Overlaid. district um, I feel like there was I wasn't on the board at the time I wasn't active in in anything happening in the town but it's what woke up my eyes and made me realize that we missed a huge opportunity there um, on the edge of Scarborough Marsh. Why aren't we, and Kerry will, will tell you, he has been you know, so frustrated with me over the years. Why don't we have low impact development here, you know, uh, Kerry? Why don't we have any, you know, why aren't we treating stormwater at the source? Why are we sending it all the way down the hill to a pond and have that be the only fail safe if uh, an oil truck rolls over an eastern village and we just have to hope that it'll run down the hill and stay in that that stormwater detention area you all live in a beautiful place um, on the marsh on eastern trail um, i drove my daughter to school up to oak hill every day and before you all came to town there was the most beautiful wildflower field there and I cried the day that left and without seeming like too much of a tree hugger I'm gonna go on the other end and say that we are on the we are on the forefront we're on the frontier of development excessive development pressures in Maine we are human beings we need our own environment to sleep in we need we need our own habitat humans are part of the ecosystem we need habitat we need to do this in a very intelligent and a very courteous manner with one another. And I'm a little bit disappointed with the lack of courtesy that there seems to be happening here. And I'd like us all to remember to be courteous to one another and that we all want the same thing, which is um, a prosperous Scarborough and a beautiful Scarborough for a long time. I come from Northern Maine. I've only lived in Scarborough for 22 years, but I bring with me the sportsman ethic that you treat your community like it's a gift from God because it is. Thank you, Robin. Uh, I would just add, I think um, I appreciated a lot of Rick's comments about and I was hoping that something like that would come up um, on behalf of the board, just a reminder to the public about our role here. You know, we, we're, not, we're not choosing this development. We're presented with plans and we have um, standards against which we hold them. And so um, we all live here too. And you know, if the shoe was on the other foot and this type of development was in any of our backyards, I would like to think we would be sitting in the audience too, voicing our opinion. Um, 
so anyway, that said, um, we're just trying to do the best that we can and balance both the development needs, which you've heard a lot about, <coughs> with uh, the concerns of residents who are make this a neighborhood. Um, and I, you know, I just, I, I don't, uh, I live in a single family home and there's five other single family homes. They're not 45 feet tall, I understand that, but they're all well within 137 feet of my house. Um, and some of them we have uh, trees in between that are very large and mature and I, I kind of wish in some cases they weren't there because it is, um, it's a barrier in a lot of ways between our neighborhood, uh, between our neighbors and we have a lot of great relationships that way. So, you know, uh, everyone's different. Some people are social and like to make that network for themselves. Others are not and would prefer to keep to themselves. But I agree with a lot of the comments that have been made um, previously and I, I hope this is not interpreted as, um, you know, a misunderstanding or not hearing and appreciating your concerns for your, your own neighborhood, but I do agree that this type of dense workforce rental housing um, is something that our community really needs. Um, and, you know, I think the thought that uh, a firefighter could move into one of these um, buildings and walk up the hill and go to work here is pretty cool. Um, we, don't, we don't have a lot of opportunities like that elsewhere in Scarborough. And so I think, um, you know, I hope you, I hope you say hi when these people come um, to your neighborhood, and that in you know, ten years from now, uh, this this the difficulty that it's taken to get to this point is all sort of pushed aside, and that um, a lot of the other points and benefits that people have talked about about um, mending community are realized here and that your wonderful community that you know of now is just a little bit larger. Thank you. Rick? Very powerful comments. Um, yeah, you're kind of stuck in a rock. It, it's tough. Um, given the plans that we're presented with and the ordinances that we have to follow, It's tough to say no uh, when things are meeting the requirements. But I can't help but just throw my two cents worth in. And if it was me, I would lower the height of Building 7 by one story. I would get rid of a couple of garages and put carports with solar array on top of it. And I would be able to reduce some of my footprint on the parking lot in that intersection. Uh, coming into the development that just that one area just seems to be the spot where I've heard most of the uh, concerns with and it's it's tough um, it's not breaking any rules um, but is there a compromise that can be made to make everybody feel like they're all part of the community that's all. Thanks, Rick. So, I think as you can tell, you have a very thoughtful board up here um, that takes their jobs very seriously. And I think each one of us brings um, that little certain bit of knowledge and experience with us that it, it's hard to quantify. I'm, I'm really I'm going to slap everyone on the back real quick before I get into it. but. I'm proud of this board. Um, we work very hard. And I'll tell you, um, for the benefit, not only just Carrie, but everyone here and at home, we sit right on the edge of individual property rights and land use. Uh, we're, we're right on that razor thin line. At what point is it okay to engineer somebody else's private property? At what point do we step in and say you can or cannot do something? Well, we do have these ordinances in place. And our first job above all at this point in time in this role, in this capacity, is to make sure that an applicant comes forward and gives us a good development that falls within the guidelines outlined and by this community. It's important that um, we didn't get here overnight. There are years and years of uh, failures and successes that have led us to this point in time. 
comprehensive plan is a big portion of what we do in this town to give us that long range planning. And at some point in the past, um, high density was seen as an incredibly good thing in this area of town for properties like this. And that's what we're watching it built out. And I think I concur with a lot of my colleagues here that it's not for everyone. And if that was my backyard, I'd probably be sitting on that side of the table. I, I couldn't deny it. But at the same time, Mr. Anderson is the developer. He is the property owner. And I believe that what he has presented here tonight fits within, in general terms, the allowable uses of this, this area. Now, do I agree with Rick that I'd love to see that building number seven possibly go down a story just to make the community happy? Absolutely. I mean, that, that's ideal. But again, we have to be careful not to try to engineer somebody else's project for them. I love to move buildings around on this map. I'd like to get the wetlands out of the way because they seem to be causing a lot of the frustration for some of that free movement. But these are all considerations you take, we have to take into account. So all development comes with impacts. Some are good, some are bad. And we definitely, this board, in particular cares a lot and we try to make sure that what we see come through here and ends up out there is mostly good much much more good than bad um, that is that's the best we can do so it is a balancing act and again I can't thank everyone here enough for helping us get through this process and go through these tough questions um, that said I'll get off the soapbox and get down to business and Carrie, I think what we need from you, and I want to point out at that last meeting we had, um, I want to make sure you understood, it wasn't a suggestion. It, it was something I needed to see happen, and there were two things. One, meet with staff. Two, get a phasing plan in writing so we can evaluate it and see what's really going on, where we are with things, and what we can expect down the road. I think that's hugely important. I think my colleagues here have done a good job uh, bringing up the fact that the landscaping plan probably needs to be updated and uh, beefed up, especially in certain areas that are going to be in the vicinity of the abutting neighbors' homes. Um, I think you should take a close look at the staff plan, uh, the staff memo, in the sense that they do have a lot of suggestions. A lot of it's just clean up, but there are some other things in there that I think need to be hashed out with staff. Uh, the trail easement agreement, I think that's one. The maintenance of the common areas agreement, which um, we've already established is probably not going to be acceptable on the town level. And uh, I think there also needs to be some communication and clarity around the stormwater pond responsibilities and the main management and what's going, now whether that's a, a communication that needs to happen with the existing caretakers of those ponds or whether or not it's um, some sort of uh, meeting of the minds and written document that clearly delineates whose responsibility, whose costs, and et cetera and then that be communicated uh, well enough, especially as the future improvements go, as added stormwater and whatnot ends up into these currently existing ponds. I think that's fair. Um, Mr. Chairman, may I say something? Sure. Well, let me just keep going through this real quick because I was on a roll, all right? <laughs> a lighting table, I think it was a good suggestion. Um, Handicapped parking spots, that was a great catch, um, and I thank you for being able to address that, and the benches as well towards the dog park. Uh, and then I think, I think that that's probably enough to get you going. Um, but again, I can't encourage you enough, and, and really, I think you need to meet with staff. I think you need to get through this, and we need that phasing plan. Now you may. Thank you. Um, a few of the things that were said here tonight with respect to like the uh, maintenance agreement and the, and the MOU, it's, it's my understanding in talking with my attorney who spoke with the town's attorney that that was no longer going to be an issue in the way that the town wanted it and that the town did not want to be a party to the agreement specifically. So I know there was some discussion tonight about 
that needs to be documented the other way. But I believe it was the town's attorney who said the town did not want to be a party to that. So we, I thought that that was all resolved. In fact, when I talked to my attorney on Friday, he said to me, he said, I will call you back. Because I said to him, I said, are you sure? He said, I will call you back if that's not the case. And I never heard back from him. So I was assuming that that was resolved. And I remember specifically him telling me that the town attorney did not want the town to be a party to that agreement. The town did not want to be in a position where they had to go in and take care of uh, responsibilities that uh, are um, incumbent upon me taking care of, specifically for those reasons. So I guess I'm a little unclear as to what we're doing there when I thought we were already agreeing to what the town wanted. Robin, is this what you want to um, I, again, I think it's going to what Nick says is talk with staff, work these things out before you come to the planning board again. I, I, I think it's really, it, it comes down to a couple things. It's, man, it's, it's really managing communication here at this point and the phasing plan will give us all a really good hint inside because I know you have like, okay, okay, I did this then and I did that then. You've got it all up there, Carrie. I know you do. It's just a matter of putting it down on a plan so that we're all communicating and looking at the same thing because I feel like I'm frustrating you over and over by asking you the same questions again and again. But with respect to the phasing plan, I'm particularly interested in according to um, it's uh, chapter 405B, section 5A, uh, 1 through 11. Chapter 405B. B. Bravo. Yep. Bravo. It okay. is the site plan review. Yep. It's Roman numeral 5, site conditions and environmental considerations. We need to, until the disturbed area is stabilized, there is still a certain obligation that you have to control the runoff, make sure it's trapped, that type of thing. So what I really want to see on that phasing plan, too, is if there are any previous phases that do have disturbed area that's not permanently stabilized, that's not um, paved, that's not built on anything. Once the snow melts, I want it on that plan so that we can go back and see when it will be addressed in all phases. Phases that are under construction or phases that have no construction going on, I'm sorry. All of it, all of it. So phases that are under construction, and maybe Steve should speak to this, but phases that are under construction, I mean, the only way we can stabilize those is with mulch during winter conditions and during construction, so. And they should be so close to a envi sensitive environmental receptor. Right, but yep. you're, you're um, but you're not expecting veg. Okay, I'll, I'll talk with Steve yep. about that. I just uh, make sure we're clear as far as Thank what you. we're being done there. Okay, if there are no other comments from this planning board, I think we are ready to move on to the next item on the agenda. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on tonight's agenda is Ballantyne Development LLC requests a subdivision amendment for Eastern Village Assessor's Map RO73, lots 21A and 21B. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so this project includes um, the creation of a 40-foot, four-foot wide, private, or 44-foot private right-of-way to serve the approved lot 140 in the Eastern Village subdivision. Uh, the lot was created as part of the 14th amended plan um, requires a private drive for addressing purposes. Um, so let's see. So staff is asking for some documentation to help understand how the lot will relate to Eastern Village, um, whether it's part of the homeowners, homeowners Association or if it will be a standalone lot. Um, that documentation wasn't provided. Um, and staff did note a spelling area in the proposed private right of way, along with the correct address that the police approved. Um, so these plan revisions have been included um, in a draft motion for the board's consideration. And again, we did receive a few letters from the public 
um, and those were distributed to the board. Carry back to you. Thank you, Jamal. Kerry. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman. Kerry Anderson, Ballantyne Development. So, if you may recall, Lot 140 was approved as part of the 14th Amendment. And uh, after we recorded the plan, we went to pull a building permit with the town. And as part of the building permit process, making sure that the addressing uh, works with public safety, we uh, ran into a problem there. Essentially, the lot that's right next door has the address of one Inspiration Drive. And the lot that's across the street from, right there, yep. And the lot that's across the street from 140 has the address of one Classical Drive. So we were either gonna need to go to the home, we are either gonna need to change the addressing on uh, everybody's lot down there or create a private right of way, which you see right there with the name White Hart Lane, so we can address it as such. And we've met with public safety, public works, uh, town planner, and I believe what you see before you is what uh, uh, we uh, came to um, as being the uh, best way to address it. Thank you. Uh, we do have an opportunity for public comment on this item tonight. If there's anyone that would like to speak, please approach the podium. Same rules apply. Please speak to the chair. Four minutes time. I'll give you the courtesy tap with 30 seconds left. Hi, I'm Jim Inglis again. I, I live at 4 Traditional Street. This is a solution in search of a problem. The uh, town uh, uh, ordinance is quite clear, and in the letter I provided all of you, it stated, it says, Private driveway shall only be assigned a street name if a sequential number is unavailable on the existing street it intersects with. It says private driveways shall only be assigned. Okay. The easy answer to this is simply lot 140's private driveway on lot 140, correctly as it gets to the inspiration, there is no number it can be assigned. So that driveway can be assigned as a private road with a name and a number. Regulation's quite clear. It's not necessary to add a 44 foot wide by 100 plus right of way in order to put a private, uh, you solve the driveway problem. Okay. It's completely unnecessary. Okay. In addition, the whole pro proposal about this right of way has all kinds of uh, uh, deficiencies. Uh, I'll mention two uh, problems. One you'll see up there, the length of lot 140 as drawn is longer than the length of the right of way, but the numbers written that describe those lengths are exactly the same number, 128.84 feet. Okay. So what is it? It's, that has to be resolved. The second, there's a serious external uh, consist consistency with the proposal for North Village, which you've seen that right of way goes right where the nature trail is supposed to go in the plans from the North Village. This from the same developer. Which is it? That inconsistency needs to be resolved. But all of it is all simply resolved by simply following the town ordinance. Lot 140 constructs a driveway. That driveway has the right, actually the requirement that be given a separate road name and that's what's done. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Norma Weinberg. I'm at Two Valentine Drive. I'm totally at the other end of the, the subdivision, and I. But my big con my concern, I guess, was when we. I, I always thought that that lot would turn into some type of a housing lot. And when I, um, today I, I got a copy of the Department of Environmental Protection paperwork, and it's a very massive thing, at least for me it is. But that lot is 11,250 square feet, and that's not with the addition that they're of the new little road next to it. That is the biggest lot in all of our neighborhood. Most of our lots run, I think, 
according to the plans between you know 4,000 square feet or smaller up to the biggest lot is uh, 9,300 and I think like 33 feet so when you add that little road next to it on it I don't understand why they need it because in New York City when they run out of numbers they give the house a half a number so like 101 and a half so why can't that be like lot zero and give it the number zero I mean there's nothing that excludes it from being a you know it has to have a you know a one two three or four it could be zero inspiration drive and they'll get their mail just fine at zero inspiration drive I, you know it's big enough that it can have its own driveway put on the corner you know it i don't understand why it needs all that extra land off to the side i mean where's our path going to go from ward street because we're supposed to have a dedicated path if you're not going to if you're not going to build ward street all the way down to classical at least give us a our dedicated path and that's right where our path is supposed to go so i i don't understand um why it needs its own little street thank you and thank you for all your work i really appreciate it thank you Hi, Natalie Burns, Jensen Baird Gardner and Henry. I'm here with Nancy Pack and Jim Marshall. And the only thing I wanted to say was, earlier I mentioned that it was very important to get the trail easement up front. And this is why it's important for you to do that. Once this goes in, uh, there may become conflicts between the proposed trail easement and this, this new road. Um, and so this board should ensure that the trail easement is provided for before that happens. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other public comment on this item? Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Rachel. All right. Um, Carrie, what's going to go on lot 140? Uh, single family. Single family. Um, I do see private roads around Scarborough that have a single family house on them. Uh, I'm not clear why White Hart Road or Drive um, would be, why it would be necessary to take more land or to set up a, a separate 44 foot strip of a private road. So I really would appreciate your thinking about that. I appreciate knowing you're thinking about that. <laughs> Take it, Gary. <laughs> so the only thing I can say is that um, that was what the town suggested that we do. Um, I think Angela. Purely and simply. I think Angela like to add to this real quick. Yeah, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Um, well, with our private weight, we do have a private weight ordinance, so you'll see a lot around town um, that were designed out, um, but perhaps not to the full extent. This is something that um, would fall, as he mentioned, um, about needing a, a private way. It could be a driveway. However, by ordinance, too, our ordinance talks about private ways needing a certain right of way for future expansion. So that's why we're trying to protect ourselves and protect, I would say, emergency vehicles from entering. We want to make sure it meets a standard. And so that's where our private way ordinance comes in to meet that standard for emergency vehicles to access. And in this case, it's really about the intent, potential connection back to Ward Street. And so this kind of leads into that and that future expansion of that. I think it was pointed out was really about the access of the trail, which is important, and staff completely agrees that that needs to be secured um, before any of this is really set up. And I don't think the, the, the developer is disputing that. I think the intent is always to have that trail to go through there, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Carrie, um, but that is the intent. And it's really about trying to meet our standards for police, fire, access, things like that, and then also looking at the future, not 
looking at it with blinders on. It's kind of looking at holistically. Thank you. So um, what you're saying, Angela, is that the, the intent is to have the public be able to walk down that private way or that, um, that new road, whatever we want to call it, as part of the continuation of the trail? Correct. It was intended for public use, that trail to connect back to Ward Street. So um, we're not saying that that would be disconnected because of this change. That would have to be worked through as was pointed out previously. It just needs to be coordinated. Could I, uh, Ms. Henderson, ask a sure. question? So it was, if I could, what's the, who's the intended owner of White Hart Lane moving forward? Nobody may. But is it going to be owned in common with the uh, North Village property? Because I get, you know, the question is, and, and I think that's the question the staff has had, is ultimately, Right, so far we've shown that trail connecting down into classical and we'll just want to be sure that there's that easement is there and that ultimately design sort of situates so that the driveway and the and the walking trail are coordinated, either separated or developed together, whatever the case may be, but that, that design gets looked at ultimately as part of the excuse me, North Village build out. So I think that's um, as was already stated, one of the important pieces. And I will say, you know, this, this issue came up when there was a, you know, this, uh, as was already pointed out, this lot was created uh, a few months ago or maybe a year ago, whenever it was, with the 14th Amendment. Um, and uh, Mr. Anderson submitted a building permit, and our code officer sort of looked at it, and there's no address assigned to it. And so it really came from our, <coughs> excuse me, our addressing agent, sort of, looking at the issues that Carrie identified in terms of there being no numbers available and, you know, really laying on the table the options of, well, renumber everyone, you know, up and down one, one or the other streets or, you know, this, is, this would be another approach to look at it. So there are a couple of different approaches put on the table, um, and this is the one that he, uh, Mr. Anderson's come forward with. Uh, Jay, perhaps you could tell me why 44 feet wide. Uh, that's that's the provision in the TND um, uh, zoning ordinance. 44 foot wide uh, is the minimum right away. So that's what we've seen. That's what um, Camden uh, was proposed as, and most most if not all the other rights away within Eastern Village are 44 feet wide. If at some point it was determined that um, the developer or the town or whoever. Uh, wanted to extend Ward Street all the way down to connect with Inspiration. Um, would there be any problem with the fact that that street is there? And that was my question about ownership. I think we'll want to be sure that that, if that ever did want to occur, that that could occur. Um, as board members, I'm sure, will recall on the northern, uh, the North Village plans, or maybe it's even on the 14th amended subdivision plan, sort of shows the potential for a future connection. So we do want to be sure that's maintained. I think um, that's what Angela was alluding to a bit uh, earlier as well. So I think that's part of the question as to who's going to have that ownership. Um, and is it really just sort of giving rights of access to lot 140 at this point and the ownership be maintained with the North Village property or what have you, I think needs to be worked out. So then it would be possible that that becomes a town street, town road. Could be. It's set up that way as a possibility in the future. Uh, I, I guess that's again, right now, I'm not, the, with the 44 foot wide, yes, the future ownership, who's gonna own it, I guess becomes a question if it's, you know, ultimately it's gonna be, someone's gonna own it and so uh, we'll need to figure that out. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Robin? I don't have any questions. Rick? Um, I just have a quick clarification question. So we're, we're calling it a private, and this is probably for Angela and Jay, we're calling it a private drive or a private way. Um, does that mean that there has to be deeded public access to that trail in the deed for lot 40, 140? Or the, I mean, does anybody, care? you can answer if you know. I mean, doesn't, I, it, I, doesn't I the deed say, for 140? Right away, yes. So the yes. deed for 140 has to say that there's, that 
that well, even though it, it's a private right away it's got public access I guess I, I don't know about for the deed for 140 it's really oh. a question of who's going to own this right away is it in a separate ownership from 140 is it part of 140 is it a ownership that that's that's the outstanding question that I can't answer for you right now so okay. we need to work work through that so I guess now for the chair if, if we're asking I, I'm not sure what we're I, if we're asking to approve this I think we have to know who's going to own it right before we can approve it so that makes perfect sense to me so I, I don't know if that's what that the, that's what the developer was looking for tonight for approval for this or no we were looking for an approval on this we followed what the town asked us to right. do right and it seems to me that that right away there has more to do with also a pass uh, access up through Ward Street and that's gonna work itself out as right. the board has asked me to work with staff on that and to right. me it really shouldn't hold up lot 140 right so it, I mean, it sounds like everybody wants the public to still have access to this trail, um, obviously. So we just need to make sure that somehow it's documented, right? So yeah, there's there's a couple of ways to look at it. It's um, either we ask this to get hashed out and then come back, or we ask staff to with with our guidance to work out the language behind the scenes. So whether that's asking staff to go ahead and say it's got to have the public access on it. We need clarify, you know, clarification on the private ownership. Staff often, too, will bring things back to us that they can't resolve with the intention of the board. So if they need us to weigh in, they'll come back to us um, and say, hey, we're at an impasse. Um, so there's really two ways you could do it. You could have them hash this all out and then come back with it, or we can give the specific instructions to staff. If they can't work it out, it will end up back in front of us. I'd say based on my experience with staff and their talent and skill set, I would be more than happy to let them figure it out and just make sure the public still has access. That's all I'd ask. I'd ask. And then, Jen, do you have comments on this? Yeah. Um, nope. I mean, that would be my major concern as well. It's just that the public access is preserved through there. Right. Yeah, my only thing is... Uh, I believe a gentleman in the audience brought it up, but the dimensions is one, the dimension is the same, but it's not drawn the same. Is there a reason for that? I actually, I looked at that. It is actually right. The the dimension of 128.84, I think is the length of each side of that right of way piece. And then if you look to the left hand side of 140, um, along that line, there's a dimension for 50 feet and then 100 feet, and that's the depth of the lot. Okay, that I follow sense. you there. Yep. Because I, I saw the same. Yeah, that's just funky the way it works out to be. But so I'm all right. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. All right. Excuse this for a second while we conference. <laughs> So I think we've sorted this out. Um, we have a draft motion uh, prepared this evening on this. There's uh, conditions, including uh, items that should be met with staff and reviewed, and uh, hopefully goes goes well. Uh, so I'll read that out now. Uh, move to pro I move to approve the project titled 15th Amended Subdivision Plan North proposed by Ballantyne Development LLC as depicted on the plan set prepared by Goral Palmer dated 2-14-20 with the following findings and conditions. Findings, the proposed 15th Amendment amended subdivision plan includes the creation of a 44-foot wide private right-of-way to serve lot 140. This lot was created as part of the approved 14th Amendment subdivision plan and has frontage along Inspiration Drive. The lot requires a private drive for addressing purposes. Conditions, one, prior to the release of the signed final subdivision plan, the applicant shall address remaining staff review comments in the memo dated 3920, final plan to be reviewed and approved by the planning department. 
Two, all ap applicable prior planning board conditions for approval of the overall amended subdivision plans of Eastern Village will remain in effect. Three, prior to the release of the signed final plan for recording, the applicant shall provide revised documentation identifying Lot 140 and proposed private right of way as a part of the, is that private or public? Sorry. Yep. Thank you. Uh, as part of the Eastern Village Declarations and Association to be reviewed and approved by the Planning Department. Number four, prior to the release of the signed final subdivision plan, the applicant shall ensure public access is provided for the proposed North Village Nature Trail that connects to Ward Street. Those are, that's the motion and the conditions. Does anyone have, well, first of all, let's start with this. That's the motion. Is there a second on this? Second. I have a second. We have some discussion. Jay, you look like you're ready to chime yeah, in. Yeah, I just uh, want to be sure we're preserving the ability for a future road connection as well. Um, so, and I, and I guess I wanted to potentially ask you to, um, you were talking about the right of way being part of the Eastern Village Association. Were you, were you talking about Lot 140 as being part of the Eastern Village Association or also the right of way? According to the, according to the motion we read, yeah. it's uh, Lot 140 and proposed private right of way as part of the Eastern Village okay. Declarations and Association. Mm -hmm. Robin? Yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'd, I'd like to see the trail easement in place. I'd like to see the work done and completed. And if there is an issue, have them come back to us. I'm not sure if that's what you read, Mr. Chair, because I can't find my draft motion. But um, I just, I want to dot the I's and cross the T's. Um, so just clarify for me, you would prefer to see the plans back here rather than have staff work it out and then bring it back if there's issues? I'd like for this all to be worked out with staff, yes. Um, but to hold everyone here accountable, I, I guess I would like to see it, yes. Thank you. So worked out with staff and then resubmitted to the board? Correct, because I think there's still questions. Okay. Any other discussion on the motion? Clarification? Um, in the language being recommended by staff? Or are you comfortable with the motion as read? I guess I want to be sure that it's not precluding. Um, I guess I would like to have our legal sort of weigh in on this. I, I, I wouldn't want to sort of paint in the, ourselves in a corner and now that the right of way needs to be part of Eastern Village if that's maybe not the best way for it to go. I guess, you know, um, and so perhaps if the board were so inclined and interested, a condition could be read, something to the effect of um, uh, that the plans be modified in accordance with the board's deliberation. And I think it's pretty clear what that discussion has been and um, to be reviewed by, you know, by planning staff. Once, obviously there still needs to be a plan signed by this body. Um, so it's not as though that sort of relinquishes um, all your responsibility on it. Um, so I would, I guess I would, without having time to sort of work through it more finely, I would so, position the condition much more broadly. Um, as, just as part of discussion. Uh, so Chairman, I might as well also weigh in and let you know that I have concerns. So, um, so let's see it again in three weeks. Okay, so we're holding up a previously approved subdivision lot for something that was never part of it before. And if that's what we're doing, that's okay. But the other thing I guess I'm saying now is we're also predicating access going up on 140 when that's really something that's purview of, one, of uh, North Village. So it just seems, uh, just seems unfortunate for me. I think we uh, think we need more clarity, and I think that will come when you have a meeting with staff and hash this out, or at least send in the proposed changes uh, based off of staff comments and feedback. So at this time, I have a motion and a second, and I'm going to call in the vote for that. All in favor? 
Well, what I would be afraid of, if, if I might, I might, if I may, it's by a point of order before you do that. Sure. Because a denial does state that the applicant can't come back for a year. So that's, it that's might. That's not the intention that. at oh, all. That's what I did not think your intention was. <laughs> so what it might be Appreciate that, uh, worth asking for a withdrawal of the motion. Um, That'd just, be fine. The, the seconder uh, with, makes a motion to withdraw the current motion or to withdraw her second. I will Which withdraw the main the motion. motion as well. Okay, so we have no motions pending. Carrie, I think you got some work to do. We'll see you again. Thank, Thank you. you. At this time, we're going to take a five minute break.
Uh, we're going to reconvene this session. The next item on tonight, uh, I'm just going to make a quick announcement. Uh, we don't take up new business after 10 p.m. It is almost 9.40. Uh, so I'm going to make the educated guess that we probably are not going to get to at least number 13 um, on the items tonight, just so you know. Um, next item up is MNR Holdings, LLC, requests a subdivision amendment for phase one of the Downs Assessor's Map RO52, Lot 4. Jamal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so as you all may recall, this is the phase one uh, mixed residential subdivision within the Downs. Uh, the applicants in front of the board proposing two modifications to the approved plans, including the addition of 2.17 acres for the creation of two new lots, 5A and 5B, and the reduction of a portion of land along the Scarborough Downs Road uh, by 1.35 acres. Staff did provide some minor comments um, in our memo, and these have been incorporated into a draft motion uh, for the board's consideration. Turn it back to you. Thanks, Jamel. Dan? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Dan Bacon here on behalf of Scarborough Downs. I'm going to be as efficient as possible um, to hopefully get to at least item 11, maybe 12. Um, so this is an amendment as introduced by Jamel. It's really to activate the next two phases of development in the Downs. Um, there's an amendment to the northern part of this phase um, to essentially transfer one and a half acres of land that's in phase one to enable the, the road realignment of the Downs Road coming up from phase one into phase two um, and to provide about a quarter of an acre of land for a new lot within that second phase that I'll talk about on the next agenda item. Um, in terms of staff comments on that aspect, um, we've recalculated the open space uh, acreages and there's 6.7 acres of open space um, in this first phase, which is 17% of that phase. Um, the percent required of, of open space, I think as the, the board knows, is 10%, so we're exceeding that, exceeding that requirement. The other components of the amendment are to create um, two lots for a, agenda item number 13, Developers Collaborative, to do senior housing. Um, that, and those lots have been created specifically um, you know, to, to create um, different lots for two different buildings that they're going to phase as part of their development. Um, staff had a question about some of the kind of the narrower land um, on the boundary to the west. And the intent there is that land remains with Crossroads Holdings. Um, and we provided for that in a few different locations to actually provide a buffer from the residential that's happening on the east side of the Downs Road to the back of the Enterprise Business Park lot. So that's why those parcels remain um, outside of right away, so that can be controlled as buffer. The same is true for a narrower strip um, along the developer development collaborative lots, lots 5A and, and, and 5B. Um, that's a narrower strip uh, in that location um, since, since um, there's going to be parking next to parking and next to the Enterprise Business Park lots, um, there's less of a buffer uh, planned for, but can be discussed during their site plan review and subdivision. So uh, in a nutshell, that's, uh, that's the proposal and um, the responses to staff comments, and we're happy to include those additional plans that were noted in staff comments, uh, sheet three, and um, I think I touched on the other comments. So I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Dan. Uh, we have an opportunity for public comment on this item. If there's anyone here that wishes to speak, please approach the podium, state your name. Seeing none, I'm gonna close public comment. Uh, does anyone here on the board have any questions or comments on this item? Seeing none, I uh, think I'll speak for everyone here when I say that address the staff comments. Uh, I've got our mo motion here ready to go. Um, Could I ask for just a point of clarification real quick? I'm sorry. I, I just want to be sure I'm clear. There's um, a running along basically between the Enterprise Business Park right away, Dan, and back to lot five. Is it A? Yes, yep. Sir. Yeah. The, it, what's the... Is that a separate, does that now become a separate parcel? It, on this plan, it is a separate parcel from 5A. So the end of 5A is yeah, okay. located right at the bus shelter that's out there in the field um, where there's a sewer easement that comes across from Enterprise. Okay. So the intent is this parcel 
and to the north are, are parcels controlled by crossroads to provide buffers between residential and the, the commercial and enterprise. So that'll sort of be, just remain as open space or whatever. So, okay. To remain wooded. Right. Um, correct. Is that uh, a label that could be added to the subdivision plan just for clarity of, for future clarity of what that is? Um, I know we're, we're going to have a condition that talks about a revised plan, so I just want to, is that, since that's the sort of stated purpose, is that? Yeah. Agreeable? Yeah. Okay. Jay, were you just asking about that sliver, the sliver of land that was the third bullet in the staff comments? Uh, third bullet. <laughs> yeah. The uh, no, I think that third bullet is referring to the, the shaded. retained land. Yep. Yeah. So I, I wasn't asking about that one yeah. at this time. Yeah. I'd like to ask about that one, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Can you tell us what the purpose of the retained land is? The retained land behind 5A and 5 B. Um, originally, it was to provide a connection from the scrubber down sign, actually, all the way up to the grandstand, because um, at one point that was all one parcel. So originally it was designed that way, um, as well as to be a buffer to um, Enterprise Business Park. Since that connection's been severed, because there's a road connection now to Enterprise that was part of the prior subdivision, um, that's really just a, a remnant um, strip that we felt also could remain in crossroads ownership with an easement to 5A and 5C. So it's it's a strip of land that connects Scrubber Down sign, the land along the Downs Road close to Route 1, all the way up to, to this parcel here. What, what's the purpose of retaining it? The purpose originally was to connect the down sign. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be retained at this point. Um, we didn't see a harm in retaining it. We're giving an easement to those two lots for, um, for their use. So is the lot basically, the lot lines are basically being rewritten as part of this or no? Right, so lots 5A and 5B are being created as part of this subdivision amendment coming out of that larger area. Okay. Boy, it'll be great when we have that phase I, plan yeah. for a crossroads. <laughs> Can I ask a question? <laughs> um, so is that strip of land essentially there to avoid the billboard law? Is that what that means when it's connected to? Well, originally it was there to connect the down sign to the grandstand because they were an operating business and they still are but since that time by connecting to enterprise that connection is no longer it's not not the same parcel any longer what does what does enterprise business drive what, what does that have to do with the, the billboard that having that, that it didn't have to do with the billboard law. It had to do with connecting the sign for Scarborough Downs to the operating business, which is way up the street. But since, but but what for, Dan? Like you had to connect it, but now you don't need to connect it. Well, we disconnected it because we met the town's requirement to provide a road connection to Enterprise Business Park. So it was a okay. So then that that first residential phase one can this, be this, sort of that road can sort of be restricted still I'm, I'm thinking about the planning board workshop that we had so I'm mixing I'm mixing sort of phases um, mm. I'm not trying to confuse this isn't to try to do it to avoid a billboard law it's it's the connection of the down sign to the grandstand when we got it's approved for phase one got disconnected. Right. It's been severed. Because we provided a street connection between the two projects. Sorry for asking that question. I just <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. It's I'm glad you did. Thank you. Because um, I just, I don't get why you would, do you have to go out and resurvey those lines or anything or? What's your question? Do you have to go out and resurvey because you're revising the whole lot lines? Are, are you asking about that five foot yeah. shaded? I, th yeah. I think the question is now, what's the, if I'm, excuse Next. me if I'm putting words in your mouth, Please. but I think the it's question late. is what's the intent of, the sh of that shaded five foot buffer area between lot 5A and 5, at uh, the backside of lot 5A and 5B, if it's 
primarily for buffering for those lots. Right. Is that your question? Yes, thank you. Right. Yeah, I think it's it can go away. Time. I mean, that can be a condition of approval that it be absorbed into lots 5A and 5B. Well, yeah. I have a question. How, how long does that go? Does it just go the length of 5A and 5B, or does it continue on? The reason I ask is it goes to there. Yeah. So the reason I ask is in, in Cape Elizabeth and in what's called the park, um, there's a 10-foot strip of land that goes behind all the houses. And instead of walking on the roads, the kids can walk along the back of the houses so they're not on the road, but they're still outside playing. And in Arizona, it was very typical to have a piece of a strip of land behind around the whole neighborhood behind the houses that wasn't owned by any of the houses so that you could go out there and the kids could whatever the kids want to do and and I walk the dog out there and stuff like that so I'd very much like to see a strip of land behind every single development 10 feet wide mm -hmm. that people could go walk on instead of going out on the road um, so I'd like to see it left but that's for my own reasons we use it for snowmobiles too but not that you guys would do that but I'm just saying I mean, practically speaking, the, the use of that strip is going to be the same. It's going to be, there's going to be some grading and there's going to be some plantings between lots 5A and 5B and the neighboring lot, um, whether it's owned by Crossroads or owned by the applicant, because they have an easement across it to, to do just that. Any other planning board comments on this? Okay, with that, I have a motion. Move to approve the project title the first amended subdivision plan proposed by MR Holdings LLC as depicted on the plan set prepared by Goral Palmer dated May 2018 with the following findings and conditions. Finding the proposed first amendment subdivision plan includes the addition of 2.17 acres for the creation of two new lots, lots 5A and 5B, and the reduction of plan development area number one, lot four, by 1.53 acres. Conditions. Prior to the release of the signed final subdivision plan, the applicant shall address the remaining staff review comments in the memo dated 3920. Two, the existing conditions from the September 17th, 2018 Planning Board subdivision approval will remain in effect. That is the motion. Second. I have a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Show that is unanimous. Thank you. Next item on tonight's agenda is Crossroad Holdings request a preliminary subdivision review for the town center residential <coughs> neighborhood within the Downs Assessor's Map R052, Lot 4. Jamal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so as a reminder, uh, the board did grant master plan approval uh, for this phase of development at the Downs in January. Might have said that already. As a reminder, this portion of land is located just to the north of the phase one mixed residential uh, development that we just reviewed. Um, so the applicants in front of the board tonight for a preliminary subdivision plan and review uh, for the first phase of the town center residential neighborhood. The pro proposal includes a 16 and a half acre mixed resi residential community with limited non-residential uses. The plan includes 23 single family lots and three larger lots that will consist of multifamily and limited non-residential development. The applicant has indicated that the entire 35 acre uh, neighborhood will be constructed in multiple phases. So staff has recommended that a construction access plan, including the proposed phases of development, uh, be provided with future submissions. This plan will be utilized by the town to address issues related to construction timing and public acceptance of streets in the development. During the master plan review, uh, the board did request uh, several areas for placemaking throughout the neighborhood. So the applicant did provide some graphics uh, for these areas and should be sure to discuss these tonight. The zoning standards do require the streetscape to be designed with street trees on both sides of all streets and driveways uh, within the, the project. Staff noted that there are some areas uh, that do not appear to meet the standard and the applicant has noted that uh, several, there are several areas in the development where uh, trees will not survive the construction phases. So the applicant should discuss these areas with the board and consider a design that allows uh, for street trees uh, to meet the zoning requirements. The applicant should also provide the board with an overview of the anticipated traffic and how this project will fit into the uh, DOT traffic permitting process. 
and staff has also recommended that the applicant include several bus shelters adjacent to the multifamily lots uh, given their residential density and finally the board is required to find that the plan is consistent with the approved master plan uh, the applicant indicated there have been several minor modifications in design and should discuss these with the board this evening I'll turn it back to you thank you Jamal Dan uh, thank you very much um, and as Jamal indicated this is the town center residential uh, area of the project this is the first uh, phase of that area um, we feel fortunate to have spent a fair amount of time with the board on the master plan level so I feel like we've kind of introduced a lot of the concepts of this phase to you already um, and made a, uh, a lot of progress on um, street designs and other elements uh, at that step so we appreciate the time that you've spent already on that um, to get to this point so this this layout is um, in terms of the housing types it's a bit like the first phase where it's it's not all single family it's not all multifamily um, it's a mixed housing project um, we're excited about the mix in this phase with a combination of uh, single family 15 single family homes that will be um, fronting front runner and alley loaded um, we also have eight single family homes proposed in a pocket neighborhood design, which we're pretty excited about. Um, these are gonna be smaller homes that front to green, also accessed by an alley. And then we're proposing three lots that we will, we will come back to you with review on um, for a mix of condo and multifamily housing. And so um, that request is kind of per staff that we first work on the, the overall preliminary subdivision, create the lots and then come back to you with review on subdivision and site plan for those condo or multifamily lots. Um, overall, this is 16, a 16 acre phase um, out of the 35 acre town center residential area that we reviewed with you in the past. In terms of, um, in terms of the different housing types, This is a perspective, a bird's eye of Front Runner, um, the, the first road coming in off of the Downs Road, and where we are planning the 15 um, initial single family lots. Uh, we're working with Caleb Johnson Studio Architecture Firm on, um, on housing types that fit these lots well, that engage with the street. Um, there's a common proposed on the left side of Front Runner um, entering in and the houses on that side are set back about 50 feet from the right of way with a green uh, in front. The houses across the street also engage with that common with on-street parking. Um, and we're designing these, these houses to have front porches, the front stoops that interact with, with the street, with the green, um, have backyards, and then of course garages to the rear served by the alley. The other housing types are the, are the pocket neighborhood units that front directly on uh, a common. It's about a 12,000 square foot green space um, that they all front on. Um, there's eight units planned there. Um, and these are the units that are likely to be, be a bit smaller in the 1,200 to 1,600 square foot uh, size. One story to one and a half story, really kind of geared more for empty nesters, uh, smaller families, smaller households. Um, and we're excited about kind of this different product in the market. Um, so those are the two different single family types. And like I mentioned, multifamily and condos would be reviewed by you at a next stage after preliminary approval. In terms of the layout, uh, this is the, the subdivision plan above. Uh, the master plan below. Uh, the framework is essentially the same. We've adjusted the specific alignments of street, streets uh, modestly. They're, it's still consistent with the master plan, really just based on the geometry of the lots and, and the layout of the lots. Um, 
So the Downs Road will be extended up from phase one, um, is intentionally uh, curving uh, to the west to, to, for traffic calming reasons um, and to create reasonable neighborhood to the right in a developable lot to the left and then realigning lining with the Downs Road up uh, at the northern end of this phase and connecting in to just south of the grandstand. Um, so we're intentionally realigning the Downs Road uh, again to, to slow traffic to um, so far, the Downs Road coming in is straight and long, so we want to we want to provide traffic calming measures through that geometry. A front runner would come off, as I mentioned, with single-family homes on both sides. Um, lot one provides for some condo development that will review in the future. Lot two does the same, um, and lot three is planned for uh, multifamily apartments. In terms of the street and, and kind of the complete street. Uh, proposal that we have. We're designing the street consistent with the master plan step in terms of lane widths, um, a bike lane, providing a multi-use path on the west side of the Downs Road that we discussed at master plan. Um, we also have a few different crosswalk locations for traffic calming um, and we've provided um, on-street parking where appropriate um, to serve both those out parcels, lots one and lot two, um, as well as lot three, and we're providing on-street parking on Front Runner to add really as guest parking, kind of day-to-day -day parking for homeowners, people visiting homeowners, when their overnight parking is in the driveways, in the garages, on the alleys. In terms of um, the private alleys, so those are not designed to be public um, as presented during the master plan process. They're private. They're going to be narrower. Um, that's where the day-to-day -day parking will be with garage parking and also uh, uncovered parking. Uh, one of the staff comments was around um, street trees and where that's appropriate. Um, we've worked hard to incorporate street trees on all the public streets um, where they they where they fit in the corridor. The location that we haven't included them is on the western side of the Downs Road coming up um, from phase one where we're leaving that mature vegetated buffer to, to enterprise. And that landscaping and that existing uh, wooded area we think serves the same purpose. So they weren't included there, just given overhead power in that location and then the, the wooded buffer that remains. Um, the other location that we're not proposing uh, public street trees are on the edges of this phase um, on Broadmare Avenue where the northern side of that street is going to be a future phase and there's going to be future construction right up against the street. So um, we want street trees to be there um, when appropriate. We think the timing is best to be implemented when construction happens on that side of the street so that we're not putting trees in and then tearing them out or running um, utility lines in those locations. So the, really the, the two edges, um, Broadmare and then Pacer Way, which is uh, a plan to connect to the next phase to the east, we would have street trees uh, on the corner, but not on the, I would say, on the undeveloped side of that street, again, for construction purposes. Um, and that will be back in you know, fairly shortly with future phases and would implement those street trees when construction's designed and planned for those two edges. Otherwise, all the public streets are intended to have street trees per our landscaping plan. The alleys, the nature of the alleys, the private alleys are really gonna be garages and um, pull in parking spaces. So um, the landscaping is really gonna be up to the homeowners. Um, there isn't street trees planned on the private alleys, just given the nature of uh, development along them. Um, there will be certainly landscaping and street trees that would be reviewed as part of site plans for each of the three lots um, that will have private drives coming in to serve them. In terms of the open spaces, um, there's a, a, a mix of open spaces. I touched on that quickly earlier. Um, the pocket neighborhood specifically has their own open space um, where all the houses front that, that green. Um, it's proposed to be um, 
owned and maintained by those homeowners, um, and it's a pretty small space. It's an intimate space, so it's not proposed for public access where the, the general public would go and recreate or sunbathe or do, do what you would do in open space. Um, it's really for the use of those those houses that front it, and it's not that big um, to have a lot of space for, for others anyway, or at about 12,000 square feet. Um, front runner common, that common along a front runner where the single family houses um, you know, abut it is similar, where it's gonna be owned and maintained by the homeowners that front it, and also potentially the next phase of front runner uh, homeowners. It's about 14,000 square feet, so it's uh, you know, a 50, 40 to 50 foot wide green, long linear green. Um, so that would be, you know, mowed and maintained by, by those homeowners. Um, the additional open space is the gravel wetland area and surrounding uh, green space and, and paths and boardwalks. Um, and, and Drew can touch on the stormwater in a minute in terms of its uh, consistency and exceeding DEP expectations, um, but there's going to be green space around that. That's about two acres, um, and there's going to be paths and, and boardwalks. And we're proposing through the declaration to have public access rights across these green spaces, the, the sidewalks, the multi-use trails, but not sort of public use of use of them given their size. Um, and I don't think they meet the town's criteria for town acceptance as, as public parks. Um, in addition to that, um, and as discussed at master plan, we're proposing a more linear kind of greenway along the western side of the Downs Road with a multi-use path um, that starts around uh, the intersection with uh, Front Runner, continues up into this phase, and then, like we talked about uh, last week in the town center area, is going to continue all the way up to Center Street. So it'll be a multi-use path that continues from this phase all the way up to throughout the project. Um, and that's proposed to be generally 10 feet wide, where it's not is right in front of um, lot one, where we felt that a slightly narrower path made sense uh, to not have too much of a, a, an area of pavement in front of um, uh, housing development. And also kind of similar for kind of traffic calming reasons as you think about a street. That's a location where there's gonna be on-street parking there's going to be people walking in and out of the condos, and we felt that having a little bit narrow pathway actually can, for say a biker coming down the multi-use path, can kind of slow the activity, um, kind of and not not invite sort of speeds on a bike or, or other things. Where in the straightaways you can ride the path at, at higher speeds, so it's really intended to kind of throttle down the pavement and um, the speeds of activity on it. I think touching on a few other staff comments um, and also on transit, I think as the board knows, we've been working hard on attracting transit to the site. We have them serving phase one. We're talking about future plans for transit in general. Um, so we're certainly in favor of providing accommodations for bus stops and shelters in the future. Uh, frankly, we don't know enough yet in terms of whether there's going to be bus service going up the Downs <coughs> Road. Um, where the transit providers will want stops because there's a balance between number of stops and headways in terms of how often they stop to, to meet their, uh, their efficiency throughout the project but also throughout the region. So we don't know yet where stops should go. Um, so we'd rather uh, work with staff in the future and add stops um, once we have more information on, on how transit's serving the project. Um, there's a chance that they may not actually go down the Downs Road. They may serve the center of the project in Payne Road. Um, that could be one service, and they could be staying on Route 1 and serving only that first phase, um, depending on their regional plans. So, again, we're in support of providing transit accommodations. We just we need to kind of let it play out a bit further before we decide where exactly stops go. Um, I think I touched on the, the key points from kind of my perspective, and I know you want to talk a little bit more about stormwater and traffic, so I have Drew here to 
touch on how we're handling stormwater, and Randy's also here to, to discuss kind of traffic and how it relates to the permitting that we've done so far. Good evening. Drew Gagnon, Goral Palmer, uh, engineer working on the Downs project. Um, so I'm going to briefly start with just the infrastructure other than stormwater. Um, so we have a 16-inch water main proposed in Downs Road that we're going to connect to phase one. We're going to bring it up Downs Road and it's going to connect to the future town center area that we discussed last Thursday. Um, besides that, we're going to have eight inch water mains coming up Front Runner, Pacer, and Broadmare streets. So every public street will have a um, eight inch water main branched off the 16, and those will all have future connections once the next phases are determined and that's to the east of the development. Um, so, similarly with sewer, we are providing an eight inch gravity main that would also connect to the stub left on phase one. And that would come up and that would serve all 23 single family house lots with gravity sewer lines. So there's no force main or pump station proposed in this phase. Um, and we're still working through the private um, public sanitary lines with that development. So with that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, and I'll talk briefly about the stormwater aspect of this phase. So this development particularly is the dividing line between Willowdale and Millbrook watersheds. Both are threatened streams per DEP standards, not impaired, but they're threatened due to chloride, and that's the main issue with all this. So what we're doing is we're providing a gravel wetland in the center of the project up here in the middle where, that Dan mentioned, and we're also providing grass under joint soil filter in the corner near Willowdale and two biocells both to the west of Downs Road. That'll mainly take the development on the west side of Downs Road just from running storm drain lines and trying to keep every elevations low and fill to a minimum. In addition to that, we're going to incorporate LID techniques as we did on phase one with drip edge systems off the single family homes. So those will allow some infiltration to the ground for recharge of groundwater, but mainly it'll treat the stormwater at the source the best we can. So I want to go back to the gravel wetland a little bit and kind of just briefly describe the benefits of us using this system. So we're going to provide sediment four bays for the inlets to this gravel wetland. And it basically has two cells and the only way for the water to flow through is horizontal flow through the groundwater. So we're engineering the gravel wetland to have the permanent pool elevation about eight inches below than the pond bottom. So during most times this pond will be dry and it will be filled with robust plantings, um, but it is close to the groundwater so that it helps recharge it with the clean runoff. So also with the, with the gravel wetland, we are trying to make it an amenity. So there will be tiered gabion walls that we're proposing. There's gonna be a boardwalk crossing the middle of the gravel wetland and we want benches surrounding it. So we want this thing to feel like it's not just a stormwater feature, a big pond set in the middle of a residential development and really trying to make it incorporated with the development where people are actually facing it with their houses and it looks good and it's, and it's, it's a nice feature to have and it feels like a park more than a stormwater facility. So in addition, going above and beyond DEP, Chapter 500 regulations, uh, we're incorporating a kind of new bypass system that we developed where I'm going to call it the melting period between November and April, where public works and the development salts and sands the roads and parking lots to keep us safe, and all that gets plowed and put in a snow pile. And then, you know, in a winter like we just had where there's a lot of rain or if it's warm, that initial first inch of melting runoff is really the really saturated chloride for um, that's really harming the threatened resources that, that we're building next to. So what we're going to do for that period, we're going to have a manhole upstream of the gravel wetland with the weirs incorporated in it. And we're going to open up the weir to allow it to bypass directly into Willowdale stream. So this is done in request by the DEP. And also this will allow during the non-melting period, so I'll call it April to November, where it's normal runoff and rain, that will be treated in the gravel wetland and recharging the groundwater so it can bleed the stream throughout the year. So the benefits of this is we get the chloride down, flush through Willowdale, and it's not bleeding the stream throughout the year, and it's creating a better habitat for the organisms and environment in Willowdale. So to that point, we are also providing a smaller overflow weir for the melting period where we're bypassing the gravel wetland, and that, what that allows us to do is still meet the flooding standard for the DEP, and we're only going to flush the first inch based on flow depth in the pipe through the piping to Willowdale, and the rest of it will be contained in the gravel wetland, which will essentially be a detention pond at that point. 
So that's kind of what I wanted to touch on with the gravel wetland and the stormwater approach that we're doing. Um, and I'll turn that back to Dan or Randy. Good evening, uh, Randy Dutton with Goral Palmer. Worked on the, uh, the traffic portion of this project. Um, this project, I'll, I'll be brief, but uh, this project uh, uh, received a uh, main DOT traffic movement permit um, in September of uh, 2019. Uh, with that project, it was phase one and two A. Um, and when you get a, approval for a project such as this, uh, it comes with a little bit of a, a buffer above and beyond what you get permitted for, and that's so that if you exceed your permit by, say, one trip, you're not going back to the DOT. Uh, on, let's see, February 21st of 2020, we submitted a letter uh, to the town that did a summary of where this project was as far as the permit level. Um, that gave a brief summary of what was permitted, what's been approved, what's been constructed, and how much uh, there was left in for credit as far as trips go. Um, based on that letter, the, uh, there was more than enough uh, trip generation left before this project or before any project needed to go back to the DOT to get a, uh, an additional permit. Um, the DOT has confirmed, you know, the buffer that I spoke of and also confirmed that um, this project doesn't need um, further DOT permitting until it's, you know, much further in the process as far as many more projects um, have been credited to uh, to the site. So that's it, really. It doesn't need a DOT permit, um, and it's it's well within, you know, uh, what was permitted plus the allowable buffer. With that, I'll turn it back to Dan. Thank you. Just have three final comments, and I'll turn it back to the chair and to the board. Um, in terms of a construction phasing plan, we're we're certainly prepared to, to generate, we want, generate one. We first wanted to introduce the preliminary plan, um, get your feedback, and feel like a construction a phasing plan is appropriate as a, something we would work on between kind of preliminary plan and final. Um, similarly to that would be kind of additional programming of the open spaces. Um, we wanted to get your initial feedback on, on the preliminary design. Um, and we're also waiting on some feedback from DEP on the gravel wetland, as Drew indicated. They're um, conducting their review, and uh, we want to get their kind of technical feedback before we have, you know, put Nicosito to work on generating detailed kind of landscaping plans around the gravel wetland. So it's not that we won't work on that further. We just think that's a good exercise um, between preliminary and final. Um, I think the other thing that I remember seeing in Bill Bray's comments that we haven't discussed is the potential for kind of flashing beacons, you know, um, crosswalk, you know, adding additional safety measures to crosswalks. Um, I think particularly what he was thinking was between front runner and lot two, um, potentially having a, uh, a flashing beacon system at the crosswalk. Um, I think we're open to doing that in the future. Um, we're a ways off from having the kind of traffic generation that would warrant that at this point. Um, and Randy can kind of speak to that. I know the town historically has been selective and using those in important places, but not sort of overusing those. So particularly the town engineer. Um, but we're open to using it. I, I think it might be a little early in terms of just traffic volume on the Downs Road. Um, I think the technology is wireless, so you can you can add those at certain points when needed without a lot of kind of infrastructure retrofit. So um, I think that's something that we'll consider and work with the board in the future as as we as more development occurs. Um, so with that, I know it's late. I don't want to go on too long, so I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair.
Thanks, Dan. Uh, we have an opportunity for public comment this evening. If you would like to speak on this issue, please approach the podium and state your name. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Uh, let's really mix it up. Rick Meinking. Yeah. Well, I've been answering my own questions and listening to Dan, and I appreciate it. I, I like the way this is set up. Um, one thing that would be interesting to see is just an artist rendition of what the alleyway would look like, uh, just so I can get a sense of, I guess, depth and perspective on the proposed building sizes. You don't have one. I just see one in the plans. This isn't the alleyway. This is a sense of the overall yeah. layout. <clears throat> those, are, those are the two primary alleys. It's, it's maybe further away than you were thinking, um, but that gives you a sense. Uh, we do have the cross sections from the master plan stage too that I can send to you that yeah. show the widths and kind of relationships. Well, I know the width, yeah, and I saw that in the master plan Thursday, okay. or last Thursday. Um, really, at this point, um, I like the open space. Um, I'm more interested in learning a little bit more about that waste or the stormwater management. I think it's pretty cool. Um, I don't know many places that deploy that. Type of system, but I hope I learn a little bit more about it. But I'm tired too. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. So, in, the, in the absence of taking more time, I'm going to turn it over back to you. Thank you, Rick. I'm going to go down to the other side of the table. Rick? Yeah, I think it looks really good. I'm very impressed by what you've done. Um, I would also like to have some a better feel for what that gravel pit's going to kind of look like because it sounds like you're going to do something. Uh, is it going to have water in it all the it time? Better not be a gravel pit. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry, I'm tired too. I'm talking to Drew, not you. <laughs> sorry, not the gravel pit. The the, uh, the gravel pond. Is that going to have water in it all the time, or is it usually going to be empty? Or I, I guess I don't really have a good understanding of how that. So most of the time, it's going to have it's going to be completely dry with the plants. Now, okay. what I mean by completely dry is it may be a little spongy. Yeah. But it's not standing water uh, during. Okay rain events, it'll pull up for standing water for the treatment aspect of it. But yeah. generally, if it's sunny out and it's not right after a storm, it'll be dry. The for the, but you're going to put plantings in there that'll look pretty. Correct. Okay, like Our this. landscape architect will. <laughs> OK. <clears throat> I like the sound of that. And then is the area around the gravel, um, the gravel pond that's shown in that rendition, is that kind of like open, that's kind of like open space? Anybody can use it, walk around it? Or? It is, and there's going to be a multi-use path that goes along the western side of it that connects to future phases and it's okay. going to be plantings they've been working on sort of these a wall system so it kind of feels like there's some tiers so there's some places to sit um amphitheater might be an overstatement but that kind of form okay. um, yes all right that's all i have rachel's going to ask for benches rachel Okay, I'm going to ask for benches. <clears throat> no, um, I, I've got actually one, I guess, probably maybe just a silly question. And, and I noticed that um, the names of the streets really reflect the race, racetrack uh, and the, the racing industry. Is that going to be carried through for the, the rest of those developments? Is that, that your intent, the rest the, of the, the plan? The plan is to carry it through the rest of the, the residential area that's in town center residential and, and probably up to the north. Um, as we talked about last week, that kind of the town center area has Center Street and Main Street, so not, not there obviously, but, but yes, it's, it's, we're gonna extend the street names um, in the, really in the center of the project, particularly residential in that theme. Okay, I, I, I know what a broodmare is, I just don't know what a broadmare is. What is, where does that it's spelled come? wrong, and we're considering whether that should be the street name. <laughs> I was wondering Sorry. about that. Oh. <laughs> Thank We've you. We've been uh, <coughs> shopping other names. <laughs> okay, I and caught you, huh? spellings. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, yes, the, um, 
uh, autocorrect is just wonderful on, on some computers. Um, I, I do have a suggestion as I, one of my questions about the pocket park was, was it open? Uh, and your answer was essentially no, it's for that community. Mm -hmm. So I, I think as that's considered, um, you need to have something that separates it from the sidewalk, otherwise you are gonna have people walking into there. Mm -hmm. Now whether that's a rail fence, it's some boulders, it's some plantings, whatever it is, it's gonna be very inviting. And if it isn't open to the public, there needs to be a, not a large keep out sign, but yeah. something that says this is this community. An edge, yeah. Um, it, when I, I took a look at what the uh, <clears throat> main Historic Preservation Society said about the racetrack and grandstands, and it referred to the one mile track as being extremely important to keep connected to the grandstands. Is that one mile track the outer track or the inner track? It, it is the outer track. Um, and the, that's because out of the two, as of last year. 50 years, right. Yeah, the inner track will be 50 years in two years. All right, that, that does so. create some interesting discussions going forward if that's, if what they say is uh, determinative uh, that it, it will destroy the, uh, the removal of the track from the grandstand uh, they are not thrilled with. I guess that's the best way to say it. Mm -hmm. So that is going to create some issues. Um, we've already started talking about the, some of the issues around dead end streets uh, and if that outer track stays that's going to create some fascinating design problems. Uh, I do have a, a suggestion on the roadway, another traffic um, calming area, and that's simply that you can have a sign that says roughly curves ahead or something like that, uh, so that as, instead of the flashing lights, so as folks are used to the straightway, a sign that said there are curves slows people down tremendously. Um, in the original discussion, um, you might recall that the board was kind of enthusiastic about the concept of having smaller commercial operations along that road, but what I, it looks like you're saying is that there is no plan at this point to do any commercial uh, buildings or um, offices, a daycare center, or whatever along there if, because it looks as though everything's taken up with multi, so uh, with apartments and we are looking at adding a commercial space within an apartment uh, on lot three. Um, so we're, we're, going th we're working with the architect now on figuring out um, having a small office type presence within that building on the first floor as a step in that direction. So that's something we can dive into more detail with lot three, but, but we are. So it is on, to, it's on the horizon. It is on the horizon. Okay. And we've taken that comment seriously and, and would like to find a way to incorporate that. Yeah, I, I think um, I think it would be very helpful for the folks who move into that area to understand that there are developments, uh, there are buildings that are going to take four or five years to build, um, but that there are actually other things that places that they can go to, mm -hmm. um, whether it's the coffee shop or, or whatever, um, that's going to be really right on the horizon. Yeah. And I think it would be very helpful for them to, to visualize that as they're looking at becoming residents of that area. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I, I, like the, I like the green space that you have. I, I think it would be helpful to set up some benches, you know, be, uh, as you go along some of the, the one of the, the park that's the 50 foot. Um, yeah, the, the I uh, can't remember the names, it, it's not Pacer Way, maybe it is Pacer Way. Front Runner's the Oh, the Front Runner, that's it, down. yeah. Yep. Um, to, to start off with, to give that area a jump start uh, as, as the open space. Yep. Uh, and encourage folks right from the beginning to walk uh, along there before the um, before the homeowners association takes over, 
it'd be helpful to do that just to give them that sort of some guidance and, and show them what what the possibility is there. That's all I've got. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Rachel. Robin. Um, is it the intent to leave the alleyways dead end? Um, the alleyways, so the, the alleyway on the eastern side, yeah. so by lot one, is going to be. You can point to where they are because I'm, I'm still. Sorry. This alleyway is going to be a through alley, so it's going to connect the Downs Road up to Pacer Way. Okay. So that'll be a, a through alley. Um, this one is also going to be a looped alley. Okay. Um, there's a very short dead end here that we reviewed with the fire department and in public works and didn't have an issue with. Will those be um, public or private? The alleys are private. And they will be maintained, maintained privately. probably yep. in perpetuity. Okay. Yep. Um, for the homeowner association. Okay, and then um, who'll be responsible for controlling the bypass system on the manhole upstream? Drew's of the... gonna do that every year. <laughs> Sorry, I missed this that. Guy. What? The engineer. I'm just oh. kidding. Um, <laughs> it's gonna be the responsibility of of the association. The homeowner association. Yes. That's what I was worried about. I think it's got. I, I think there needs to be a third party. There, there needs to be an executed contract agreement in place early on, mm -hmm. and whether it's M and R or somebody who assumes it at first, um, that's too important. I think um, uh, a technology to to mm -hmm. leave for a homeowner association. That's, I think it needs to be put in place. Just sort of like Rachel saying, like give them a head start with the open space. Mm -hmm. Give them a head start too, with at least getting somebody on board to who in November and April will yep. go in and do that. Yep. I think that you have an opportunity here for placemaking. I didn't. It's it's late. I can't remember in your presentation what you talked about placemaking, but I think the gravel wetland, you know. Because it is going to be, I think Drew had said, well, there'll be robust plantings in there. We don't want little kids running around in there because we know that the the um, soil has to have a certain compaction or uncompaction to it, rather. So would you use that as an opportunity, you know, in placemaking to put a sign up there that says, don't run in this, and this is why kind of a thing? Or Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of educational opportunities okay. around the gravel wetland. Great. Yeah. Um, bus shelters. I I don't want to kick the can down the road. I think we at least need to put a, um, a holding place. Say it will either be on this side of the road or that side of the road. But I think we we need to at least not kick the can down the road and put something in there. Um, Did you talk at all about construction access plan? Will that be in the phasing plan that you're going to be giving to the town? Yes, it will. Okay. I'm, I'm all set then. Thank you. Thanks. <gasps> Thanks, Robin. Jen. Okay. Um, comments that I have that have already been asked, but I just like, put another check mark next to them was just a note of... Um, only residential shown in this phase and so I sort of agree with some of the prior comments about hoping to see some mixed use development um, coming in this area if not through this segment of this phase then hopefully shortly thereafter and how that will integrate with um, with the residential piece um, I also had uh, notes on bus stops and then uh, you know similar to Rachel's comment about kind of leading off on a good foot and you know she was talking about stormwater maintenance but I think the you know bus and transit in general is another good opportunity for that so just you know for someone we've <laughs> uh, we've all heard a lot tonight about what 
it looks like when you have buyers who were shown something or perhaps not shown something early on and then what that looks like down the road as it plays out for better or worse but you know if there is the intent here through this project and I would you know I guess speak on behalf of the board that I would assume we would like to see transit through here as well go ahead and show it show a, a dotted box um, you know potential bus stop even if you don't you don't know that that's going to be a reminder to all of us and to you and to anyone looking at you know lot 17 for a potential house and they say oh cool there's going to be a bus stop down here um, I think the spacing of the crosswalks that you've provided at the end of the, the two sort of primary streets there would be the logical places for either of those, whether it be a stop at one or the other or potentially both. Um, but it does look like there's enough room, um, at least for a placeholder. And mm -hmm. you know, I would imagine that as those conversations continue, that could be further fleshed out. Is that a bench? Is it a fully enclosed? heated shelter with electricity and Wi-Fi. Nobody, we don't really know right now, but mm -hmm. um, just a nod to wanting that, to plan for the, plan for the street that we want to have. Um, and what else? Oh, um, I guess just sort of a general comment and the, t the tables in this, uh, the February 21 memo regarding, um, traffic and trip generation are pretty helpful but even still a little bit confusing i'm not sure why but i just i feel like i kind of want to see almost like a a gra like a bar chart or something with here's what was permitted trip wise and based on what you're presenting to us now here's where we're here's where we're at and if that's a little then great if it's getting close to the top and that's just sort of like a visual reminder to all of us that we're um, approaching that that maximum um, and I understand you know that will fluctuate a little bit as you have additional developments come in the innovation district and such but um, I just I do kind of feel like that would be helpful okay. um, I think that's, that's all I have for now Thank you. Thanks. Colleagues did a nice job. Staff did a nice job. The applicant did a nice job. So um, I'm not going to add a whole lot to this. Um, we know that we're going to see this several times over and in multiple phases, uh, multiple stages. I forgot something. Oh, <laughs> boy. I was just coming into really the home quick. stretch there. I, know, I was going to wrap that all up. It's really quick, and now it's gonna we were going to get really, to bed at a reasonable hour. What's really up? It's really annoying. <laughs> just let you go but anyway I just want to echo the uh, non overuse of RFBs and encourage that as kind of like a back pocket poker hand option that we can reserve if we put these crosswalks in and see a problem down the road certainly we wouldn't want to not install a treatment if we thought that it was going to enhance the safety of something like that but if you do that all up front without the demand like you're talking about then you we really have nothing left um when if if and when it does become a problem so not only rfps but there's other options for blinky things if that's something that's attractive that's all carry on sorry thank you <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> so uh that said, uh, this is a request for a preliminary approval. Um, at this stage, I'll, I'll make a motion to uh, grant preliminary subdivision approval for Crossroad Holdings LLC's town center residential neighborhood. Uh, we are going to have a lot of bites of this apple. Does anyone want to second a preliminary approval? Second. Any discussion on this? Can you, can you just remind me of a preliminary approval? It means it's going to be back. In general, in, in general, with the layout and all this other stuff, we're pretty comfortable. They're going to go back and work through a bunch of stuff. We're going to get into the nitty-gritty details at a later date. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Sure, that is unanimous. Thank you very Congratulations. much. Congratulations. We'll see you again.
three weeks, two and a half. <laughs> All right. I am going to make a motion to table items 11 and 13 based on the hour of evening. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Those items will be tabled. Next item on tonight's agenda is the staff report. I will pass. I'm good. I'll pass along to my other colleagues if they have anything. Yeah, I just wanted to let the planning board know, and I'm sure Robin may uh, circle back to this as well, uh, that the Long Range Planning Committee has, um, I won't quite say completed their work, but has moved the most recent revision of the comprehensive plan out of committee and back through the public review process and trying to get it into, um, uh, into the council's purview. So I guess what I'd say at this point is the Long Range Planning Committee, having done all the sort of background work, re, um, uh, received public comment on the revision, received responses from the various boards and committees in town, made a host of revisions, and um, they're satisfied with the plan, um, recognizing again that it will go through more public discussion and review and ultimately get to this board for a, a formal workshop, um, as well as council for formal adoption. But I just want to let you guys know that that is out there. It's available online. Um, so you'll be seeing emails in the next day or three when, as time allows. Um, we're really going to start sort of letting folks know that that's, um, that work has been um, at least taken to this level. Um, so it's great news. Yeah. Any other staff comments? Slash report? Hmm? Administrative amendment report. Uh, none at this time. Correspondence. Planning board comments. Rachel. I think you had a correspondence. Oh, I have oh no, I have. I was planning board <laughs> comment. Go ahead, Rachel. Okay, um, I just want to reiterate something I said at the workshop um, that as this gets more and more complicated um, with more and more activity going on, we need some sort of central way to ensure that each developer that comes before us actually knows what's going on elsewhere in the Downs. Uh, and that's the, what reminded me of that was the, the different ways that people looked at traffic or the different um, times. One of the groups forgot to put in the DC, uh, the, 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 the uh, lot 53. Um, lot 53 remembered to put in the traffic coming from the other group. Uh, and there's got to be a way to figure out how we look at or how developers can look at the whole project that's going on so they're not all of a sudden making assumptions or plans based on information that's only maybe one week old but has changed in that week as another, uh, as another proposal comes forward to us. So I, I don't know how to do that. I just think uh, the conversations that we've had about looking at um, finding some way to have a repository for the whole of the downs um, would be very helpful, not just to us, but to the developers coming through. Thank you, Rachel. Robin. Um, yeah, from on the Long Range Planning Committee, um, as Jay mentioned, the 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 comp plan, it will be up and available for folks to take a look at. Um, we are, as part of the Long Range Planning Committee, uh, members have taken on one of the five visions associated with the comp plan. And we hope to um, sort of just do, as part of a public outreach um, effort, um, we're gonna be writing articles or op-ed pieces um, that will go out to talk about each of the five visions and how the comp plan was really a remarkable process. Um, and I really want to commend staff for all that they've done on that. And they've just, they used a consultant very wisely 
And I, I, I did the analogy of, I feel like they laced up the plan, like they, they put it together at the beginning and, and summarized everything. And then at the end, you'll see that there's this like action plan with all the to-dos that were in there. And I just, I can't say enough good things about how the staff did a really good job sort of lacing it up and putting the icing on it for us all to take a look at. So I encourage you all to do that. And um, I'll be writing about vision one in the comp plan, which is uh, the marsh and our natural resources. And others will be writing about economic development and growth and all these types of things. So, so be on the lookout for it. And um, I'll look forward to updating you in the future of where the comp plan is. Thanks, Robin. And there are planning board comments. I'll just throw in that uh, every, every time I come here, you guys impress me. So I appreciate it. Um, oh, you, you do, do a, did a great job tonight. You, you, yeah. do, uh, you guys do a wonderful job. Uh, the talent level of everyone in here, the expertise is it's incredible. So proud of y'all. <laughs> Thanks. Scarborough should be proud of us all. Uh, that's it. I will make a motion to adjourn. Second. Any discussion? <laughs> all in favor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Wasn't a hand for discussion. We are adjourned. <laughs>